Okay, Jack, we have Amherst Media with us. We are recording. You are a co host. So, okay. Let's go. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of May 5th, 2021. And Happy Cinco de Mayo to you all. Our meetings are hitting some of the more festive holidays as we also met on St. Patrick's Day this year. So uh, 4th of July is on a Sunday, so we won't have to worry about that one. Um, based on Governor Baker's executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, uh, GL chapter 30A, section 20, and sign Thursday chapter, or excuse me, Thursday March 12th, 2020, the planning board meeting is being held virtually using the Zoom plan platform. My name is Jack Jemsek and as chair of the plan Amherst planning board, I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.30 PM. This meeting is being recorded and is available via Amherst media live stream. Minutes are being taken. Board members, I will take a roll call when I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then place yourselves back on mute. Maria Chow? Here. Tom Long? Here. Andrew McDougall? Present. Doug Marshall. Present. Janet McGowan. Here. Johanna Newman. Here. And myself. So board members, if technical issues arise, please let Pam know. If technical difficulties occur, we will may, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. Discussion may be suspended while the technical issues are addressed and the minutes will note if this happened. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. Opportunity for public comment will be provided during the general public comment period and reserved for comments regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Public comment may also be heard at other appropriate times during the meeting. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during the general public comment period. If you wish to make a comment, join the uh, meeting via the Zoom teleconferencing link that is shown. And the link is also listed on the meeting agenda posted on the town website via the calendar listing for this meeting. Or you can go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute. When finished speaking, residents can express their views up to three minutes and at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. Uh, I just, I'd like to note that I had some correspondence with the town regarding the format of our Zoom meetings and the ability of the attendees to view each other, which was a topic of discussion and uh, uh, some edit editorials you know, last year. And I was able to confirm that the, the town of Amherst uh, IT department has set the current Zoom uh, settings for security purposes and to essentially eliminate the possibility of Zoom bombing of inappropriate images by an attendee without the need for additional monitoring by Amherst staff. So um, that was just a little research that was that was made. So with that, uh, we can review the minutes of uh, April 7th. Is that correct, Pam? Yes. Okay. So uh, do we have any comment amongst the board on these minutes? I see none. Uh, any motion to approve? So move. Okay, Janet, and a second? A second. Andrew. All right, any further discussion? All right, I see none. So I'll do a roll call here. Um, uh, Maria, please. Approve. Andrew. Approve. Doug? Aye. Tom? Approve. Janet? Aye. Johanna? Aye. And myself is yes. So that's unanimous approval of these minutes. And we will make a minor modification to the agenda and present 
uh, item A under old business as the first item of business um, in this meeting. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I jumped the gun. Um, public comment period. Okay. And give that a minute, I apologize. Um, so I see one hand raised, uh, Ian uh, Camara, state your name and address. Hi, Ian. Can you unmute yourself? I'm actually not Ian. I'm at Ian's house. <laughs> this is Jerry Weiss. Oh, okay. From Middle Street in Amherst. Um, I'd just like to uh, speak to my ongoing disappointment that uh, the planning board will likely give another special permit to an archi archipelago building project that won't result in a single affordable unit downtown. I may be speaking too soon as archipelago directors could voluntarily offer affordable units and take the tax credit offered. This is especially distressing since a member of the planning department has admitted in public that the interpretation of article 15 used for the past 12 years was a misinterpretation a misinterpretation that has cost the town dozens of affordable units in the three previous archipelago buildings um, and likely in this one as well. Hey, hey Jerry, I'm just yeah. saying th this, this is on the docket and the public um, comment is for, uh, well, I'm getting to, I'm getting to, to, a, I'm a, one sentence from, from not on the docket. I'm leading up to the, a misinterpretation that the planning department has an excellent fix for. I'm urging the planning department and the town council to pass a moratorium on new permits before another building project like this comes along under this grievous mis misinterpretation. And I realize that must be repeated over and over until a new law is passed. Adding to the problem are the current woeful design standards downtown, also being reviewed with excellent suggestions for improvement. It boggles my mind that a permit moratorium is not being supported by the entire planning board and town council. All of the planning department's suggestions would result in a far more successful downtown as new buildings would be more attractive and the diversity of inhabitants now not present would be a boon for businesses as well as advancing equity in our town. Thank you. Okay, I see no other further public comment. And, um, and so we're gonna move the old business item, SPR 2020-07 Kendrick Park Playground, presentations of signage information regarding conditions four and six of the site plan review decision. Um, properties map 11C-244 in the RG zoning district. Um, and Chris, I assume you're, you're letting, uh, Nate, run with this, right? Okay. Yes, Nate, please. please. Yeah. Yeah, thanks everyone for letting me um, present the Kendrick Park signs. I'll, I'm gonna share my screen. Kyle and Dave, thanks for your patience. The, um, <clears throat> the design review board looked at the sign um, yesterday and they said it was fantastic. No. <laughs> they, they had a few comments, but um, mm. overall they, they did like it. So the, um, just to preview again, this is the design for the play area in Kendrick Park. Uh, the yellow area is the playground with equipment and then there's sitting areas and a walking path this you know north is to uh is this way to the right here's east pleasant street there's an you know a new paved walkway i call it like an east-west walkway um the major walkway into the play area and there's a, a planting area and there'll be that's the location of the welcome sign so the idea is that there's you know just one one sign for this uh for the play area um Sorry about the different page sizes. So originally when we presented this, you know, with the bid documents, the idea was to have um, granite posts and a sign that was, you know, less than 12 square feet. So it wouldn't trigger a special permit and it would have, you know, something on the front and the, something on the back. And, um, you know, staff thought it would be uh, worthwhile to try to integrate a sign design into the wayfinding system, which is going through uh, review right now. And so working with, um, a sign designer, we've, you know, this is the proposed sign. So it has um, the same uh, color and font and, 
you know, kind of uh, stylistically the same as the wayfinding system, uh, still using an eight by eight granite post. Uh, there's T brackets um, mounted into the granite. You can see here the, the, um, the fasteners would be visible. So that, you know, two sign fabricators thought they could be, you know, they, they could become a decorative element. They could be painted or they could be a different material. Uh, the sign itself is, you know, five feet long, a little, two, a little over two feet high. Uh, the proportion works nicely here. Um, you know, there's a little bit of space in between the post and the sign and it's a two-sided sign. So the front of the sign has welcome to Kendrick Park. Uh, you know, we have the town, the new town logo. Uh, the sponsors for the, the, um, for the playground need to be noted. You know, the town of Amherst, the park grant program and uh, community preservation act funds. And, you know, this, so this, you know, just to scroll down quickly, here's the wayfinding sign. So the font is the same. And, um, you know, a lot of the proportions are the same. The posts are different, you know, it's, a, it's for the recreation area, not, you know, for a street side sign, but it really does try to um, use this template as the basis for design for the sign. The back panel, um, you know, so it's two panels mounted to brackets. And so, you know, the idea for that is um, a panel could be removed if needed, if it's uh, vandalized or needs to be fixed as opposed to, you know, having um, the original idea showed basically a sign that was integral to the brackets. And so essentially the brackets and the panels were all one piece. And if any, if it was damaged, it, the whole thing would need to be replaced. And so, you know, with this type of sign, you can take a, one panel off. You could even replace a bracket individually. Uh, anyways, on the back side of the sign, it would just have the logos. We're required to have the funding logos uh, for the park grant program. And if there's anything the CPA committee would like and the, um, the idea is to have 12 by 18 uh, areas where um, the rules and regulations for the park and safety uh, protocols for the playground could be could be listed on a separate vinyl sign that would be you know surface mounted to the panel. Um, another panel could be a map of downtown showing uh, you know parking, restrooms, and other you know uh, other shops. So it, you know it helps orient you you know if someone's here where they can go to get uh, we can you know have restaurants and different establishments listed. Uh, in the third panel, uh, we've talked about having environmental education component to the park. You know, we have some rain gar gardens and on um, on-site stormwater management. So there could be that. Um, I know previously at the planning board, there was a discussion in the design review board, like the idea of having kind of a community bulletin board. So where someone could post other things, or maybe it would be like a monthly rotation at the town, the bid in the chamber could actually have um, an area where events are posted. And so there's some concern about putting it on a sign like this because then anyone might start posting anything on the sign. And so one of the design review board recommendations was to actually have a separate wooden post with you know, a 12 by 18 board that would accommodate this kind of rotational um, event posting. So it wouldn't be on this welcome sign necessarily, but there could be a separate standalone post. And so um, that's something staff is considering, but it's a nice idea because you know, otherwise there's no other places in Kendrick Park to uh, you know, there aren't any kiosks right now to post information about community events or what's happening uh, downtown. Um, in terms of um, comments from the design review board, you know, they, in general, they, they um, you know, they, they, uh, they thought the design was an improvement. You know, they had suggestions about, you know, possibly raising the, the top of the sign to be, you um, level with the granite post. So instead of, you know, having a three inch step down, it's a, it's a level across and that would mimic the design of the wayfinding signs. Um, you know, the Kendrick Park is, is title case. So it's a capital letter and then lowercase. Um, and the, on the wayfinding sign, it's all capital for Amherst. And they thought that was fine as long as, you know, we're consistent with the application of, of, of typeface and font. So, you know, if, you know, for, the thought could be this, this sign could be a, a model for other recreation areas. And then, you know, for instance, at Groff Park, it would follow the same pattern where, you know, Groff Park wouldn't be fully capitalized. It would follow this type of uh, font pattern. Um, and, you know, they just, and they said also just make, make sure you're, we're consistent with our spacing, our lettering and overall kind of aesthetic. Uh, and their, let's see what else did their memo say. Um, yeah, the lettering is the same. Um, and then, right, they, they would prefer to have the logos on the back of the sign. So, you know, I, I, the, the funders haven't really indicated 
that. But you know, we we're acknowledging them here, and it works. But it'd be you know, we thought in terms of the aesthetic of the sign having um, the funders also have a you know a visual logo or symbol, and it you know it may not work with this with this design. So you know, we're going to have a space for them on the back. Um, and I think I think that's probably it for the DRB comments. Uh, Tom was there if he wanted to report anything that I've missed. Can also accept comments from the, the board. Yeah, I think they were also emailed around today, so um, they're posted as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you got it, Dave. You, Nate, you covered it. Uh, Tom, I didn't get a chance to to look at those comments. So if maybe <laughs> if there's anything that deviates at all, you, you you're welcome to. Yeah, no, I think Nate covered pretty much all of it, um, and then some. So yeah, I mean, there was just, there was a lot of discussion. Um, the, the notion that, um, uh, I was responding to Andrew's comment from the previous time we saw this sign where Andrew preferred the kiosk based sign for Kendrick park, because it would allow more community engagement and postings and, you know, events and things like that. So that's where that comment came for the backside. And so there's just a, a negotiation about whether that information belongs on this sign or whether there's another dedicated location for that. Um, but, but other than that, I think all of the other comments were, were covered here. Great. So the, the wayfinding sign that, that concept, mm -hmm. um, is is uh, somewhat new, and I'm I'm wondering if Chris or Nate can say to what extent we are you know in this conversion process for this signage in town. Sure. So you know, here's um, you know the wayfinding system really is you know uh, kind of you know there's a hierarchy of signs, right? So there's you know welcome signs, which you see here, a larger sign that would help uh, direct vehicular traffic, you know, and, and pedestrians, but really it's helping. You know, uh, that's the first level to help people, uh, you know, show them where the town center is or really welcome them to Amherst. And then there's a series of other, um, you know, there's then pedestrian kiosks and other wayfinding signs. Um, you know, this is another example of a directional post that has been um, presented to town, I think, I believe to the town council, the community resource committee. Um, Chris can correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, again, using the same design template, color scheme, font, and everything to help direct people uh, more specifically to, uh, you know, to certain locations, institutions, you know, parking and area amenities. So it is relatively new. I think, you know, the town's been working on it for a number of years. We had a technical assistance grant a few years ago to help with kind of wayfinding and branding. And, you know, we see it as a way to um, simplify and then also streamline, you know, a messaging for visitors, you know, how to navigate Amherst and find places. So. So I just wanted to add that um, most of these signs are in the public way. And so um, the jurisdiction is um, with the design review board and the town council and the planning board doesn't necessarily have a role with the public way because it doesn't, it's not covered by zoning. There was one location that um, is at the corner of Triangle Street and uh, Main Street and it's on the Emily Dickinson property um, and so em uh, Amherst College and the Emily Dickinson Museum have given the town permission to uh, put one of these signs in that location in place of the sign that Emily Dickinson uh, Museum has there. Um, we're going to add a panel that talks about the Emily Dickinson Museum. And that sign, it's on private property, but it had to go through the um, Zoning Board of Appeals because it's oversized. I think actually all of these signs are oversized. Um, and if they were on private property, they would be limited to four feet, um, square feet, unless they got a special permit from the CBA. But since they're in the public way, um, they're not limited uh, as far as the um, size of the sign. So um, I think that's, that's about all I have to say, but we, we're gonna try to uh, install these signs um, probably starting this summer. Uh, ben Breger in the office has been working very closely with the sign designer, and um, this is kind of the the pattern of signs that we're going to hope to have throughout town, and you'll be seeing these um, in in several locations. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Doug. Yeah, I, uh, Nate, uh, did I miss the, uh, showing us where the exact locations of these are? So the 
the wayfinding or the Kendrick Park sign? Both. So the you know we're if we're discussing the Kendrick Park sign, there's really this sign. There's only one location, only one sign for Kendrick Park. If we zoom up a page in the park, there's the East West Walkway, and um, and it's there's a, a planting area right here. You know, as you, if you're approaching from East Pleasant Street, walking west, the sign will be right here before you kind of enter the playground area and the in the play area. So that's that's the location of the Kendrick Park sign. And then the wayfinding. The other signs are going to be located in um, at least four locations. Um, there's one that's going to be down along Route 9 coming up from University Drive somewhere along there. We're working with the state to figure out exactly where that can go. Um, there's one at the Amity Street and University Drive intersection where the, um, what is it, the market, I forget the name of that. Um, New Market, New Market, yeah. New Market Center at that location, there's a sign. It's going to have two panels um, pointing in two different directions. So people uh, coming to that part of town can be directed into the town center. Um, there's one that's going to be uh, probably on the south side of the town common as it um, is adjacent to College Street. And it's either at the southwest corner or the southeast corner of that. Um, larger portion of the town common. Um, and we may be working with, we may try to work with the railroad company to get um, a sign up on the railroad trestle as people come up College Street. And then we have the sign at the Emily Dickinson Museum at the corner of Main Street and Triangle. Um, in addition to that, I think we have 11 or 12 of these of those post signs that Nate showed. Um, to direct people to various locations throughout town. So those are going to be really primarily located in the downtown area from the northern part of Kendrick Park down to the intersection of College Street and South Pleasant. And in addition to our wayfinding signs, Amherst College is also um, embarked on a sign program. So they're coordinating with us about locations and um, we're going to try uh, to keep you know, the sign cluttered down, but also um, make sure that people know how to how to get around and how to um, get to the places that they want to go to. So I think that about covers it. There are two other types of signs that we, or three actually, that we may be doing eventually. One is a an arrival kiosk, um, and we would have at least one arrival kiosk at the Boltwood Garage, and it's it looks it's kind of a tall uh, version of the sign that Nate showed you, but it would have a map on it that would show people how to get to various places. Then there would be some smaller um, kiosks scattered around town. We don't have locations for those yet, but those would also have maps and locations uh, for, to direct people. And then um, we may have interpretive signs, which would be um, a slanted panel on, um, on a footing that would um, tell people about a certain site. It might tell people about the town hall or Grace Church, or we haven't really determined exactly which uh, locations those would be um, located at. And then, oh, I might as well tell you about the other type of sign. We have a writer's walk sign program that was recently approved by the Historical Commission. And I think those signs are also in the town right of way, which is why they didn't come to the planning board. But um, those should be uh, being installed over the summer. And those um, are similar in style to uh, the signs that we're um, showing you here tonight. So we're trying to make them all coordinated as much as possible. OK, so given, given the, uh, the status of the rollout, which is mostly this summer, do you want comments on the graphics of the signs? Well, we're here for the uh, comments on the Kendrick Park sign, so that if you have comments on those, that'd be... That'd we be probably nice. don't want comments on the graphics of the wayfinding sign in general because they've already been approved by the DRB and the um, town council. But if you had comments about the Kendrick Park sign, that's what we're here to talk about. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Doug. Janet, please. Um, I have a quick, quick comment. When I was reading the thanks to the um, town of Amherst and the park program and the CPAC money, 
I immediately thought that we should be thanking Mr. Um, Kendrick. And then, um, but then I realized like, oh, this is really for the playground. And so I wonder if the sign should say Kendrick Park Playground and showed that the money went that. I, I just sort of felt like immediately when I read Kendrick Park, I thought we, we should acknowledge Mr. Kendrick who provided the whole park. So that, that's just, you know, I don't know if you wanna add the word playground or add Mr. Kendrick somewhere, but I just, that was just my reaction. Thank you, Janet. Um, any other comment from the board? Uh, I see none. And we can open up to the public. And I don't see any public comment. So any further discussion, people. Andrew? Hey, Jan I was just going to say, I, I think Janet's suggestion was a, a really good one in terms of the recognition um, could be a nice touch. So would you prefer, you know, recognition for the Kendrick family or say have this say Kendrick Park playground or Kendrick Park play area? Is there? Personally, I think the family, I, I don't know how you, you would be able to fit um, more words on here without really ruining the effect of the sign. Right. Yeah, no, I think, yeah, that, that acknowledgement can, could be um, considered and worked into the, right, the text. Yeah, at least acknowledgement of the thinking of the family and the, the gift they left. Thank you, Andrew. Would anyone um, like to make a motion for approving this with any additions, perhaps? Joanna? I'll move to approve the sign as is. OK. Is there a second? I'll second, but just to clarify, would this as is or with the recommendations that were recommended by the sign review board? Let's do it. Uh, well, let's see. So the recommendations by the design review board were to move, nudge up the sign a little bit. And then our recommendation was consider acknowledging the family. Um, I guess I'm open to either of those. I don't what, what, what is the what, staff, what do you need from us? Like, is that in terms of emotion? Yeah, I think that if you think that the sign should be moved up to be flush with the top of the uh, post, you should say that. And um, if you think that it should acknowledge the Kendrick family's gift, you should say that. All right, Johanna, you wanna revise your, your motion with that? I'm gonna rescind my motion and see if anybody else is ready to make a motion on this. Okay. May I offer um, my own opinion? Yes. <laughs> I do not agree with the design review board that the top of the sign should be flush with the top of the granite posts. I think that the granite posts really stand out here as kind of a monumental um, aspect of this sign and they really stand out more without the sign being uh, flush with the top. That's my personal opinion, um, but I think it's really nicely designed the way it is. So I'm just offering that for what it's worth. Okay, sounds like we need to have a little bit of discussion on the, on the two uh, proposed modifications. Um, anyone? And Andrew. I, I would just say like, I, I actually agree with Chris's opinion on that, but I, I also would rather defer to the design reviews board um, opinion on this. So I, I'd be comfortable going with their recommendation, just given their efforts to work on the consistency. Uh, so I, I, would, I would be comfortable with their position. I mean, the design review board also, you know, discussed this. So it was a, it was a suggestion. I don't know how, you know, how strongly they're <clears throat> recommending it. Um. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I would confirm that it was a recommendation from, I believe it was from one person on the review board, and then it was briefly discussed. And I don't think there was um, a universal consensus, and so we were putting it forward as a suggestion and something that might want to be looked at. I don't think it was. 
a recommendation that the sign will perform better or look better if it were in that condition. I think we haven't seen it. So we were just hoping that design, uh, the designers would look at it and see um, how they reacted to it. So that would be the recommendation would be to study it as opposed to necessarily do it. Okay, and then and and with regard to the recognition of the family, would that be on on the on the front side or on the back side? Uh, what were the thoughts on that, Janet? So I would just be happy to. I, I don't feel like I don't want to put so many cooks in the brew on this sign, and so I think maybe we can just send these ideas to whoever the decider is or the designer is, saying, you know, several planning board members felt like the Kendrick family should always be acknowledged or it should be acknowledged. And, uh, you know, other people felt this way that the sign post was higher, you know, the granite posts were, you know, so just, I don't wanna, it just seems like I don't really have a, you know, I, I wanna defer to the people who have spent the most time with it, but maybe just offer the, offer some of our suggestions without it like a vote and having us discuss and kind of, you know, spending so much time on this. So can we just do suggestions? and had them pass them along. Do we need to vote on what we really think as a group? I guess that's my question. You need to vote to approve the sign. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then you could offer suggestions going on. <clears throat> and to consider okay. the suggestions. So, I think I, 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 I'm, I'm gonna move, you know, as chair uh, with regard to the, the, the proposal, proposal as uh, presented by Nate. Um, and is there a second? Second. All right, Janet. Uh, any discussion? I see none. So we can do uh, roll call. Maria? Approve. Andrew? Aye. Doug? Aye. Tom? Aye. Janet? Aye. Johanna? Aye. And myself, aye. Great. All right. Thanks, everyone. Oh. Thanks, Nate. Right. Thank you so much, Nate, for that presentation. Chris. And I'm going to get the preamble here together for the next item, which will be um, a joint, uh, wait a minute, joint public hearing? It's just joint because it's the site plan review and the special permit. Um, oh, okay. Okay. May I, right. may I give a little introduction here? Sure. Sure. Okay. So um, the applicants came to us with um, an application for a site plan review for this building. And as we looked at their application, we uh, became aware that they needed dimensional um, modifications for certain things. At first, we thought they needed a dimensional modification for um, the side setback on the north side and the side set back on the east side, and that they also needed a dimensional modification for the height. Um, when we looked at it more carefully, we realized that um, the side setback for the uh, east side is really not um, something that's available <coughs> to them at this time. The bylaw has been rewritten in, in that aspect since um, One East Pleasant Street was uh, designed and, and approved. So um, what the applicant is going to do and hasn't done yet, but I expect you know, in the next day or two, is going to submit an application for, um, to have the side setback on the east side, which is supposed to be 20 feet because it's adjacent to a residential zoning district, um, reduced to five feet. Um, the residential zoning district in this case is the cemetery. Um, what they're going to do is be uh, asking for a special permit under section 9.22 of the zoning bylaw. There's an existing building on the site, which is um, very close to the cemetery. I think it's within five feet of the cemetery. So it does not conform to that um, side setback requirement. Um, so the building commissioner suggested to the applicant that they could apply for this special permit under section 9.22 to uh, reconstruct essentially um, an existing non-conforming building. Um, and then the town, will, the planning board will need to make a finding that uh, 
what is being um, proposed is not more detrimental. I forget the exact language, but once we do receive the application, we'll um, do an addition to your development application report and explain this a little bit more and explain to you what finding you need to make. But those are the three um, special permits that are needed. A special permit for um, modification of the north setback, which is uh, supposed to be 10 feet and it's being proposed to be five feet. Um, a modification of the height requirement, the height is supposed to be 55 feet and the applicants are asking for 56 feet, nine inches. And then the third thing, which isn't a dimensional modification, it's a nonconformity that they're asking to be recognized. Um, and that would be a reduction of the setback from 20 feet to five feet. So I just wanted to put those things into play. Um, and I think that Jack could open up the public hearing for the, oh, and then there's another part to this, which is that, um, the property immediately to the north of where the building is going to go is um, a separate property and that's going to be used as a staging area for construction of the proposed building and the applicant has had a conversation with the building commissioner about um, the wisdom of separating out these two parcels and these two projects so the applicant has also submitted a site plan review application for use of that adjacent parcel for a construction staging and access area. So as he goes through his uh, application uh, presentation, he can explain that to you. But so you're looking at two site plan review applications, one for the building site, one for the staging area and a special permit application that you have right now for side setback on the north side and height. And as I said, in a day or two, we'll be receiving another special permit application, which you can uh, consider at a future time for the, the um, nonconformity issue on the east side. So just wanted to kind of put all that in place. I think we wrote about this in the design in the development application report, um, but it's a little complicated. So I just wanted to share those those facts and those thoughts with you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. So with that, uh, I will do the preamble for this. And again, it's uh, 708. Uh, there's a schedule for 635, so we're good there. So in accordance with the provisions of MGL Chapter 40A, this joint public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted, and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR 2021-07 and SPP 2021-02, Archipelago Investments LLC, 11 East Pleasant Street. They request a site plan review approval for construction of a mixed use building containing dwelling units in combination with a ground floor retail commercial uh, space, including approximately 1300 square feet of retail space, lobby, uh, leasing, fitness, trash area, mechanical space, uh, elevator, parking and 55 apartments under section 3.325 of the zoning bylaw. And they are also uh, requesting a special permit as uh, Chris uh, uh, discussed to modify dimensional equipment requirements for height, side and reset back under footnote A of table three, section six of the zoning bylaw. Uh, and this is map 11C, parcels 276, 277, 309 and 310 of the BG zoning district. And again, um, Chris just mentioned some of the uh, um, nuances of, of the special permit uh, uh, for this. So are there any board member uh, disclosures? Uh, Chris, your hand is up. Yeah, Jack, um, you can uh, go ahead and open the public hearing for the um, the public hearing for the 640 uh, public hearing, which is the site plan review for the oh, Jason oh, do that lot. at the same time, do that at the same time, and then just lump them all together. Eventually, they'll have to be closed separately, but it'd be a good idea if you just put them all together for now. All righty. So that one um, is, I think it's 202109, right? Oh, nine. Oops. Okay. Might be on the back of the sheet that you have. 
Sorry. Um, there it is. I got it. All right. And then um, in addition, we have um, this public hearing uh, for SPR 2021-09, Archipelago Investments LLC, 15 East Pleasant Street, uh, requesting a site plan review approval under section 5.00 of the zoning bylaw for an accessory and incidental use to a permitted uh, principal use on an adjacent lot for construction, staging, and management of 11 East Pleasant Street project uh, post-construction. Um, the site will be st uh, stabilized with as asphalt surface and fenced. And this is map 11C parcel 275 and it's in the BG zoning district. Again, uh, lumping these two together on any uh, board member uh, disclosures. And I see none. Um, and the applicant is welcome to present uh, your proposal. And we have Kyle Wilson and David Williams. Thank you very much. Um, Kyle Wilson from Archipelago Investments. Dave Williams is here as well. Mark Bobrowski, our attorney, is called in on one of the call-in numbers. Um, if I could, uh, can I get control of the some of the screen here? You should be able to, Kyle, because you're a panelist. Okay, thank you. And Kyle, I just looked to see if there was a way to move that phone number into panelist and. I don't see it, so it. Um, you have to let me know if you want him. Um, okay. If Mark, Mark, I believe he's a six one seven number, so I'll have him okay. speak up if need be. Let me share my screen here. Um, well, before I do, I, we're here to talk about our eleven East Pleasant project and adjacent fifteen East Pleasant. Um, as we'll see on um, the survey and the civil and the site and everything, it's a. It is immediately north of our One East Pleasant project in downtown. It is um, stretches from Pleasant Street back to the cemetery. Um, and the pub property reaches up to um, uh, Prey Street. So it's obviously a very important um, parcel in town as any of our uh, limited BG district parcels are. Um, so it's a, uh, it's a, piece of land that is in, very important to the future of Amherst. Um, what we put together is a couple quick slides just as an intro, um, and then I will get into the um, uh, then I will get into the documents that we have uh, submitted and forwarded. Please hold a second. I'm being asked to Let's see, uh, I'm not able to share here. Hmm. Hmm. Pam has all the documents. She can show them. I don't you... have an introduction, an introductory one though. Kyle, do you think it's a problem on your end? Uh, it could be. Um, let me, please hold one. Can you hold one second, please? Mm -hmm. See me? I can see your screen. Beautiful mountain scene. Yeah. Uh, that's Okay, so here we are. Um, uh, hold on a second here. Let's scroll to the top. So, um, let me reduce this. So, um, there's just nine slides, so it's very quick. Um, and it's the context within which we are doing the projects we're doing in Amherst and within which um, housing in Amherst uh, will be affected. So this is from the US Census 2020. It came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, it shows that Massachusetts is growing. Um, added almost half a million new Massachusetts residents in between 2010 and 2020 to just over 7 million. 
Um, the growth rate of Massachusetts at 7.4 is far and away the largest growth rate in all of New England um, and is close to states like Virginia. Um, you can see that um, um, Massachusetts is of all 50 states, number one in education, number one in innovation, and number one in life science. Um, so the growth that we've experienced in the past 10 years um, is based on, on, on being one, number one in education, innovation, and life science. And especially following the last 15 months, we uh, obviously expect that to uh, continue going forward. Uh, with that, um, Massachusetts has a housing crisis. Um, and over the past 30 years, housing production has been cut in half across the Commonwealth. So that 900,000 units were built between 1960 and 1990 and under 435,000 were built between 1990 and 2017. So as a result, Massachusetts home prices have grown faster than any other state in the country. And you can imagine what it's done with rents. So earlier this year, um, the legislature passed a, uh, a new economic development law that is targeted at housing production and housing production lying behind uh, the housing crisis that Massachusetts currently finds itself in. Uh, this uh, housing choice initiative, uh, as the housing portion of the bill was, was known as, had broad support uh, across the political spectrum. Um, the Citizens Housing and Planning Association was one of the big supporters of this um, because uh, uh, people across the state understand that housing production is uh, the number one uh, tool to use to uh, combat the housing crisis that we have. So uh, Rachel Heller, the CEO of CHAPA said, more homes in town centers and walkable locations are critical to grow our economy, preserve our environment, promote public health and meet the needs of our residents across income levels. Um, uh, appreciate the initiative shows real support for communities to create opportunities for much needed housing production. Um, we've seen this in Amherst, obviously. Um, 2015 housing market study that came out, um, analyzed uh, where we are in Amherst, what, what the opportunities are to catch up with the lack of production that we've seen. And the number one, the number one recommendation was unlock multifamily development. Uh, obviously the consultants were well aware of our zoning bylaw, were well aware of how much land was, um, was given over to single family homes and how much a little land was allowed for multifamily. So um, also a housing study that was uh, a forum that was done more recently in 2019 here in Amherst about opportunities for growth and affordable housing in Amherst. Uh, two quotes from that presentation. Um, this town suffers from a severe housing shortage and high land prices, restrictive zoning, unpredictable, often lengthy permit process and neighborhood opposition to new multifamily development makes it very hard to build the housing that we need. Um, this map is the town of Amherst zoning bylaw. So on the left is the bylaw per the website. Um, in the middle, uh, we have highlighted uh, in red all of the land that is single family residential uh, use by right. Um, we've also in gray shown institutional or non-residential land. So land that is unable to be built with any multifamily. And as you can see from this, um, you know, 97% of, of the land is beyond that is taken up, is, um, is, is either single family, which is by far the most exclusive and land intense type of development that, that, uh, that you can do, or uh, institutional or, or non-residential where we are not going to see any housing growth uh, for the future. So you can see that there are very few areas in the town of Amherst that are forced to do all of the housing growth work that Amherst needs going forward. Um, as of today, 53% of the housing in Amherst is already rental. Uh, demand continues to increase. And the question that we need to um, understand and be prepared for is where will renters live in 2025? Because they're going to live somewhere. These are the projects that we have uh, been a part of here in Amherst. Boltwood Place in 2012, Kendrick Place in 2015, Olympia Place in 2016, and One East Pleasant in 2018. Our Spring Streets project is in construction. 
And these projects are all LEED Gold. They've all met those environmental uh, objectives and been certified. And these projects together pay over $1 million annually in Amherst property taxes. That's every year forever. Uh, we've uh, begun our own property management company, Amherst Innovative Living, that started in late 2017. Um, we have a wonderful partner in that with in Alex Laguerre Sierra, who um, has done an amazing job um, uh, building that company. Um, all of our projects have social media. All of our projects are available for folks to see how we handle that, how we manage uh, the properties. And in 2019, um, Alex, no, no, not Dave or I, Alex uh, was uh, awarded the um, Leader in Innovation Award by the Chamber of Commerce uh, for the work that she had done with our company, Amherst Innovative Living, providing the property management for these projects. And the last slide is from three days ago. Um, and um, from the, the horror of 2020, uh, from the extremely difficult um, time in November and January, and thank God for Georgia, uh, we are in a situation, we've been whipsawed from that to this. And what this is, is GDP growth that is uh, projected to be as high as the height of the post-World War II economic boom. Um, so we're in a situation now where, um, where the strains that are currently uh, being felt in Amherst housing promise to, uh, to continue and, and become uh, potentially more so. Um, so that is the initial intro. Um, and from there, I wanted to jump directly into um, the project. Um, here is the site survey uh, done by Harold Eaton Associates. As you can see, our One East Pleasant project is here. Uh, north is to the left. Um, uh, East Pleasant is on the bottom here. Prey Street is here. And the site is has a very unique shape. Um, it is made up of five parcels. Um, those, as I mentioned, those five parcels have been in the Summerlin family for um, um, since the 60s. Um, and we are developing four of those parcels, the four southernmost parcels, these over here is lot one. And uh, lot two is uh, for the construction staging and um, uh, for uh, future use. So these four parcels here consist of the Summerlin building and the um, Piper building. Uh, this is the pub building. Uh, the, the, there is an easement that connects all of these parcels. And at one point in the past, the bank property was also a part of this. So when it was split off, there were um, access to Prey Street and Pleasant Street were preserved. And this easement here serves all of the parcels. So it serves this one, it serves this one, it serves this one, it serves the bank. So the intent is to keep, obviously keep that open to serve the bank as much as we can and, and, um, and look to redevelop this portion of the site um, and preserve this portion. This is the landscape plan for 11 East Pleasant. This is showing the footprint of the building and the, uh, the approach to the property. Um, as I mentioned, uh, to start this site uh, has frontage on East Pleasant Street and goes all the way back to the cemetery. Uh, currently the Piper building resides in this location and the intent of uh, the design of the building is to allow for a view, which you'll see in some renderings a little later on, from the south end of Kendrick Park, from this intersection, through the site, back to the cemetery. It's currently blocked by the Piper building. The intent is to create a little more space, uh, open that up and be in a position where uh, the view through uh, 1 East Pleasant and 11 East Pleasant is um, available on the south side. Uh, on the, on the, the street side, we have a, a retail uh, that faces the street. We have a residential lobby with the stair and elevator that go up, which I'll get into in the architecturals. We've got a, a leasing area and a fitness area. And then this is drive under parking, which is very similar to the drive under parking on the building next door at one East Pleasant. So uh, this drive aisle, uh, this, would, this drive aisle would come in over the easement. Uh, vehicles would turn in and come in here to access the parking that's covered and enclosed. Uh, this is a trash room 
And uh, this landscape area uh, along the south is um, planted with mature Armstrong, columnar Armstrong maples, which, which um, build uh, a sense of scale looking back towards um, the cemetery. Uh, the civil plans are uh, uh, produced by SVE. I won't bore you with the with too much of it, but um, you know this is the existing conditions plan, which shows the parking out front, which shows the easement, which shows the parking for the bank, uh, the property line as it zigs and zags up to Prey Street, um, and the existing building, which is almost on the property line on the back on the cemetery and and uh, zigs and zags itself um, on the uh, east property line. This is our uh, site plan, uh, which uh, I think will be a little easier to review architecturally. Um, this is our grading plan, uh, which is uh, uh, one of the more difficult things to reconcile here uh, for us on the design side and for the design team. We have an existing building here where we can't change the grade here. We have an existing condition along the street. We can't change the grade and an existing condition along the entire north side, which we can't change the grade. So the management of the surface stormwater on this site um, was tricky to execute. I think we've been able to come up with something that, that works very well. Um, it allows for uh, all the grades to work, uh, the water to flow where it needs to flow, and then allows for uh, some pedestrian access here through this uh, opening in the building, which is, which is open to the public. Um, we can come back to the utility plan a little bit. This is the erosion control plan. Um, I will get right into the architectural. This is the architectural packet that we submitted to the town. This first rendering um, uh, is from Kendrick Park across the street uh, from Kendrick Park. Uh, it shows looking back towards 1 East Pleasant and 11 East Pleasant. Uh, it shows how the site is very narrow as it projects to East Pleasant Street and then shoots back uh, um, almost 300 feet back to the uh, cemetery. Um, the intent of the building is to uh, uh, finish the courtyard in, in One East Pleasant. Um, as you'll see in further renderings, we've got a pedestrian access that cuts through the building that allows for that the pedestrian experience to extend uh, into the middle of the site because it's such a deep site. Um, and the materiality of the building is the same Alaskan yellow cedar as has been used at Kendrick Place and uh, One East Pleasant in the past. This is the site plan. Um, that shows the roof plan of uh, 11 East Pleasant, shows the building adjacent to the sidewalk, to the north property line, the east property line, and the south property line, shows the pavers and the site wall as, as the pedestrians. Uh, this front section of the building aligns with 1 East Pleasant and allows folks, if, if they so choose, to be able to walk through and under the building and extend that pedestrian experience. These are the um, uh, building coverages and lot coverages, which we can go into further, but breakout diagrams to, to quantify each of those. This is our um, first floor plan. And this for, first floor plan shows very well um, all the things that we were trying to balance on this project. As I said, it's 276 feet long, very long site. Um, this area here is all pavers that are identical to the pavers used at One East Pleasant. Um, would create a continuity of experience uh, amongst uh, from downtown once you're off the public way. Uh, the access, uh, the purple on the street is the retail. Um, the, the building above uh, holds tight to the property line. The first floor below pulls back to create a larger uh, public space, uh, give a little more room and um, imply that the act entrance to this, uh, the residential entrance to the building is on the south side under cover uh, under the overhang of the building up above, which brings you back here into the lobby or into the leasing area and uh, fitness beyond. Uh, so th again, this is all at grade, um, working with the civil, that grade gets you through here and you can extend to the north and the drive uh, uh, vehicular access would come in along the easement, would turn in underneath and would go back to this covered parking um, in the back. On the ground floor, again, we've got retail with two bathrooms associated with it. Uh, we've got a lobby uh, that will have mail rooms and sitting areas. We've got an elevator and stair, uh, a package room, which obviously has new meaning now, 
um, and a storage area. And beyond it, we've got a leasing office and a leasing lobby, a bathroom, fitness, mechanical, electrical, bike storage along the east wall, uh, management in the back, uh, storage management in the back trash room here. Uh, we've got uh, the lighting uh, shown where we've got the identical down lights to one East Pleasant shown on the exterior. We've got bollard lighting that is shown on this south side, number two here. As, uh, as folks come down along this entrance way, there will be also some recessed site wall lighting um, in the site walls and bollard lighting to lead uh, the procession back to the entry. Um, and then we have these strip LED uh, lights that are above this column here and this column here. So these are brick columns that are teardrop shaped that go up to the, the, the wood ceiling in this case and the zinc ceiling in this case. And around that, that column would be an LED light. So it would uh, uh, down light uh, the brick column itself and highlight the materials. Uh, we've got floors two, three, four, and five here um, where we've got uh, elever, elevator, uh, fire stair, uh, fire stair, janitor's closet, trash room with a trash chute and uh, an electrical room. So we, uh, the form of the building has, there's kind of a head and a tail here. And this is where uh, the, the form is broken in the middle. Um, and we have a open corridor on the east side. So when you step off the elevator, uh, you'll be able to look down out through and into the, um, the cemetery. We've got a double loaded corridor which is uh, just about 60 feet wide uh, perpendicular, 63 feet wide on the angle. Um, and um, you can see that that remains the same for floors two, three, and four are identical. Uh, floor five, there's a community room on the fifth floor looking to the west over the park uh, that will be available to all the residents along with a, uh, a bathroom. The roof plan shows uh, the approach to mechanical um, the stair elevator and penthouse is here. We, each of our buildings have fresh air that is on the house meter that runs 24-7. Uh, that is an energy recovery ventilator. We've got two of them here. Uh, these are the condensers that run the all electric, uh, high efficiency, hyperheat, electric uh, air source heat pumps that are on the roof. We've got a propane generator um, that is on the roof. And then on the south side, we have uh, photovoltaic panels that run the entire length of the south and are on the 45 degree angle, which is optimal and are integrated with the structural requirements of the roof screen, um, which, which can uh, which add up quite a bit. Um, we've got elevations, uh, all four elevations. This first elevation on the top is the elevation from Pleasant Street. You can see the first floor is set back. Here's that, the column that I mentioned that supports that and floors two, three, four, and five step up here. We've got the elevator overrun integrated with the roof screen uh, to, um, to hide the energy recovery ventilators and the electric air source heat pumps and the solar uh, photovoltaics facing south. Um, on the north side, you can see the gash as we've called it through the design process. Uh, but this opening that uh, is where the vehicular access uh, and the pedestrian access overlap. Uh, you can see the Alaskan yellow cedar siding as that wraps uh, on floors two, three, four, and five, it drops down uh, to a couple feet above grade and then raises back up as it gets back to the cemetery. Um, we have uh, a number of sliders in, um, in the facade uh, and those sliders have Juliet balconies, uh, similar to the Juliet balconies we've installed um, in other projects. Uh, this is a gray brick that is on the uh, ground floor uh, for the bathrooms and the back of the lobby. This gray brick continues underneath the cedar as it um, uh, encloses the, uh, the ground floor parking. Uh, up above here on this other elevation, again, you can start to see the site walls again. And then this is the entrance to the building, uh, the residential portion of the building. So anybody coming underneath this overhang here would turn the corner and go underneath here back to this section of the lobby to enter the building. On the south side facing one East Pleasant, you can also see the opening where that the form of the building changes. This is the entrance along the south side that would bring you along the retail and then along the lobby. This lobby uh, is obviously part of our means of egress for the building. So that lobby is lit 24 seven. 
um, that lobby would pull people back here and then you'd have this ability to see through, walk through um, and, and process through to uh, uh, the properties on the north. Uh, these are the site walls and this shows that uh, we've shown a stair that would connect this lower grade at 11 East Pleasant to the higher grade at 1 East Pleasant uh, through the site wall. This is a view to the leasing area. These windows are to the leasing area. These windows are to fitness. Again, the brick on the ground floor that pops up and the Alaskan yellow cedar above. Uh, the zinc accents that are on each of these individual um, uh, vertical elements in the facade become a zinc, uh, become more pronounced in the middle of this building. So this zinc that is horizontal here wraps under and is the ceiling of that space below. We've got a couple renderings that will help. This is a view, an aerial view um, of the south. Uh, again, the Alaskan yellow cedar siding, uh, the zinc cladding, uh, and the gray Danish brick on the ground floor, the glass storefront um, that pushes back to give uh, the, the public space out front. And then this is the circulation that brings you underneath the cover of the building back to the residential entrance to the building uh, itself. This is the, uh, the space between 1 East Pleasant and 11 East Pleasant, uh, which is planted with the uh, columnar Armstrong maples uh, at scale that, um, uh, that highlight this view back to um, cemetery. This is the curb cut that would remain. We'd redo it obviously, but this is the curb cut for the existing easement that the vehicular traffic would follow up and, and be able to turn in and get under the building. Um, this is a view from Halleck. Uh, again, the intent here was to show that without the Piper building here, um, pedestrians are going to be able to look through and, and see the trees on the backside of uh, the cemetery. So while this is a, you know, uh, this is a section of the BG district that does abut a residential district, uh, we are 300 feet from houses. There are no houses here. It's a cemetery, obviously. So um, the setback from houses is beyond the trees um, in, in the distance. Uh, this is a close-up uh, rendering of the southwest corner to show some of the detailing. Uh, this building will have uh, rock wool insulation outboard of the sheathing as the other buildings have had. We are increasing it on this building to four inches um, beyond three inches. Uh, we're using that four inches to give depth to the facade, um, create a rain screen enclosure, uh, give some detailing above the, the windows uh, where the, the cedar uh, turns and creates a shadow line and then allow for the zinc uh, accents to, um, to highlight elements of the facade. Uh, you can also see the brick below on the first floor where it's turned vertically on the columns. Again, to highlight the verticality of the columns, we've got an overhang. Uh, this is the overhang that you would walk under to enter the residential portion of the building and a wood ceiling that will continue from the outside into the retail and into the lobby. So that whole first floor has, um, has a wood ceiling. Here's a view of the south um, portion of the building where, where the form changes to accommodate the, the pedestrian path down, down below, where you do see the zinc, uh, the zinc accents um, uh, becoming more prominent. Um, and again, that zinc becomes the ceiling on the ground uh, floor uh, below, and you've got a wood ceiling up above here. Uh, on the north side, we see the materials come together again. We've got the gray brick, uh, Danish brick on uh, the first floor. We've got the Alaskan yellow cedar, and then we've got the zinc uh, accents between the windows. This is the retail space on the ground floor with a wood floor and a wood ceiling. You can see those columns inside the space here. And then that one column that pops out of the space and is kind of the central feature for that, that, that plaza out front as people um, circle around. Um, this little hallway here is back to the bathrooms. And then these are the bollards along the north side of the building. These are the materials. Um, we've got the Peterson Tegel brick. Uh, we've got a, um, a, a zinc cladding and we've got the cedar wood rain screen. Um, so we've kept the material uh, very simple, uh, the form somewhat simple, and then um, have really tried to push the uh, uh, environmental performance of the enclosure such uh, that we've gone with four inches of rock wool insulation out for the sheathing. So um, with that, I think that is as much of the drawings as I intended to go through. Um, I can, this is my first Zoom meeting with the town here. So I could, uh, um, I'll defer to how well, you know, however else folks wanna uh, take it from here.
Thank you, Kyle. You're welcome. Uh, so Thank you. This, excuse me? Thank you. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, very nice looking project, uh, no doubt. Um, uh, impressive. So at this point, um, we'd like to summarize the site visit uh, report that the planning board conducted last Friday. Uh, would one of the planning board members like to volunteer uh, that for a presentation summary of what we saw? Uh, where's the hands? <laughs> you want me to summarize it? I guess, I, yes. I'd, I'd be happy to summarize and then people can add I, in. I was going to, I was going to recommend you, Johanna, because you asked really? a lot of questions and you seem like, <laughs> like locked in. So this is great. Thank you. Sure. Um, <laughs> so a bunch of us met, um, at the site on Friday um, initially, we uh, we started at the East Pleasant side and just uh, got ourselves kind of anchored on the site, figured out, you know, where are the pop property boundaries, where would the overhang be, and then we walked um, essentially the entire perimeter of the site. Um, and I'd say we spent most of the time near the cemetery side and looked at what trees would need to be taken out and what the facade on the back would look like and feel like and discussed, you know, moving the fence and just like what that interface on the back end would be like. Um, and then we came back around to the front and talked about just the public right of way and how the site would interact with the sidewalk there. So that's what I recall. Um, others can feel free to chime in. Yeah, any other uh, additions to that, uh, the site visit report that, that Johanna provided? Okay, I see none. So we can just have a general discussion uh, from the board members at this time. Uh, I, I have some, but I think, I mean, I'd like to hear from our, you know, the several architects on our, our board uh, because they'll probably cover anything that I would have to say much better. <laughs> um, so hands, Maria, please. Sure. Uh, thanks, Kyle, for that presentation. Um, I, I had time uh, to look through the set a little more thoroughly after a few other comments, and um, they kind of touched on the similar issues I had, but um, first I just want to sing some praises. Um, I really like the attention to detail, the materials, the sort of care about wrapping materials and the carving of the facade. Cause like you said, it's a really long building. It's tough to make long buildings like look good and interesting. And I think you've really achieved that. Um, <clears throat> particularly on the North side, I love that what you call the gash. Um, I also love that the fact that you're putting PVs on, you know, just thinking about the future, you've got to do that. And also the exterior, um, Roxel preventing the thermal bridging. That's something that, yeah, every project really should take advantage of. It's a pretty minimal add to do, to, that goes a long way. Um, also liked how you um, worked with the site and tried to open it up to, to get a view of the cemetery. And um, I wonder if that area with the trees um, is occupiable at all, if it's just visual um, or if it's helping with rain catchment. Um, that was one question I had. And the other question was, um, I was a little confused about when you said you're going to preserve lot two. I didn't know what that meant exactly. I, I know that you were using it for staging and taking the building down, but um, what does that word preserve mean exactly when you were saying? Um, it, I don't know if you have plans for it or if it's, I mean, it's obviously your the part of the project's property, but I just wonder if you could share anything about future steps with that. Um, and I think the last question was if this was also gonna be lead gold, um, but, um, but I think a lot of other people have um, mentioned things about, you know, the parking and, and the retail space. And um, maybe I'll, I'll leave that to other people to bring up, but I, I have concerns about that and I don't have any solutions, but I, I imagine this will be a multi-meeting process and that, um, 
well, hopefully we can work with you to hone those pieces and get those optimized. But I, I, I feel like this project really listened to a lot of the things that have been said by town members as far as, you know, making the building feel like it's not right up against the street, having a more of a public space and giving more breathing room at the sidewalk. So, um, yeah, I, I think that um, hopefully with, you know, working with the planning department and the planning board and hearing um, constructive criticism will help make this project better and better. And um, yeah, thank you for bringing it. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Uh, Doug, please. Did, did Maria want answers to a couple of those questions or not? Uh, it, 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 I, for me, yeah, uh, uh, that would be great if Kyle wants to, to jump in or, or, uh, David and sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll hop in. Um, the, the question about lead gold. Yes. The intent is that this would be lead gold as well, um, through the lead for homes, pro, um, um, uh, program, uh, re regarding the site to the North, the, uh, the pub site, um, the intent was to ins it's, it's obviously a very awkward site in terms of shape in terms of the survey um, the intent was to try to because there are so few downtown bg parcels to make sure that um, there's future opportunity in bg um, i think that that site it's the goal through you know through the construction period of this of this project would be that it serves the construction it keeps it off the street there's a construction trailer there's a lay down area there's mock-ups, there's uh, some limited parking, and the whole area is fenced in. Uh, beyond that, I think the future of that site, because it is uh, the, the future of that site will have something to do with one of the adjacent sites. Um, I think that there, we, don't, we have no plan for it. Uh, we don't own any of those properties. Um, I, don't, I don't have a timeline on any of that stuff. Just thinking long-term, when you look at that zoning map and you see that uh, how much of that area in the town of Amherst is um, single family only. And knowing that we have uh, housing needs that are gonna continue long into the future, um, that we have to, you know, we have to um, be, we have to think about that. Um, regarding the, and you had one more question about rain catchment, Maria. Um, the, oh, the can you occupy the space underneath the, the trees? Underneath the trees would be red twig dogwoods, which are similar to the red twig dogwoods that are at One East Pleasant. Um, so you can walk through there, but it's not intended to be occupiable. It has a red twig during the winter and it leaves out and it's pretty robust during the summer. Very good. Um, Maria, do you have any other follow up to that? Okay. Uh, Doug, please. Okay. Um, so I'll echo uh, Maria's kind of intro. Uh, I think it's, it's a very attractive project and um, you've put a lot of attention into breaking down a pretty large building. Um, I guess my, my biggest question has to do with the, the retail, uh, the small size of it. And um, I, I kind of question how viable it really is. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think I would be very supportive of your thinking about the upper floors and whether you can pull that, uh, elevator core back and uh, or, or rearrange the west end of the building to give you more room for a, a more a larger retail area. Um, and I, 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 I guess I'm a little bit torn about the, uh, the setback of the retail and the overhang on the west end, um, you know, because I'd, I'd kind of like to give that square footage to the retail, but I understand that you're trying to Give a little bit of relief to the sidewalk. Um, I think if if I'd have a hard time deciding which way to go um, if I were making the decision, but I think that's probably the the biggest uh, question I'm going to have. Um, and and in the second the sort of related to that, the leasing office. Um, given that you own two other buildings in the vicinity, um, I'm wondering whether you could just lease all three from some other building. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, maybe you part of reconfiguring the first floor would be to allow the retail to expand back and then you don't have the leasing office in the way. Um, 
third third comment has to do with the vehicular access to the parking under the building. Um, that sort of S turn you're asking people to do to get in looks tortuous, uh, you know, and it's hard to really believe if you put a, the vehicle turning radii on your floor plan, um, you know, it's hard to believe that works, I, to be blunt. Um, so um, maybe, maybe it'd be nice to see a diagram just so you can prove it to me that it works. Um, let's see, next, uh, I guess I'm a little bit surprised to see so much wood on the exterior. Um, I know that you've had several other projects with a little bit of wood uh, that's relatively unfinished. Um, and I know at least the one, um, I think it's behind Judy's, um, you know, I've started to see a little bit of the gray weathering or some people might call discoloration um, on those on those boards. And so I guess I'm just surprised in terms of your durability and the longevity of that material um, in our in our climate. Um, I don't know, I guess this is my chance to just go through my list here. Um, sure. Uh, the the separation between the west end of the building and, and one East Pleasant Street, is it uh, in excess of the, I think it's 30 feet that the code requires in order to not have to put any fire separation rating on your exterior walls? Um, Next, uh, I'm, I guess I'm curious to hear about your target customer base for this for this building. Um, when I did a breakdown of the of the bedrooms and the units, uh, you know, you've got 134 bedrooms. 80 of them are four bedroom units, and so 60 percent. Um, and when I look at those four bedroom units, those are those appear to me to be a definite student oriented unit. It doesn't look like a family unit. Um, so, you know, one of the one of the conversations we've had in town, and you know, a lot of the comments we get about some of your other projects, um, is that we're building too many too many beds for students, and I know I, I'm. It's clear you would disagree with that, and I I think there are others on uh, both on the board and off who wouldn't have a problem with that. But um, I guess if you could just talk a little bit about, about kind of what your target client group is. Um, parking, um, since I wanted to expand the retail. Um, that could impact the number of parking spaces underneath there. And obviously you don't, you're not required to do any parking. So um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about your experience with your other tenants at your other two buildings and the, you know, how many, if you know, um, and maybe Chris might have some information, um, how many of them are ending up getting permits from the town for parking? Um, you know, versus just not having a car. Um, in the packet that we received, the shadow studies were basically illegible. So um, I'm, I'm hoping you can give us a little better information. They were just photocopies and the shadows were not showing up. Um, and then the last question had to do with the sewer capacity that the town has for, for the project. and whether I, I wasn't, I didn't really see that on Jason Skeels' report. So I, that's a question more for Chris uh, to confirm that there is sewer capacity for this project. Uh, thank you. Great comments, Doug, thank you. And Kyle, you want to take a, make you want me to go, responses? I see a hand up. Do you want me to? Respond. Oh, I can well, yeah, I think I, I think we're okay. you know looking at some efficiency efficiency here in terms of uh, you know one on one response. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, so the the first one question about the retail, Doug. Um, we did look at it a number of different ways. 
Um, obviously, retail in the past 15 months has been very difficult to gauge and manage. There's a lot of available space right now. Um, um, we have a space next door, immediately next door in One East Pleasant that is just under 4,000 square feet, uh, which we have found is too big um, in some ways, uh, is, a very, is, a, is a large size. Um, and so managing that walkway through the space and working with that vertical core um, as you have, as you and a couple others have pointed out, is something that we looked at. And the trade-off is larger retail with no back for, and fewer parking spaces, or what we think is the right size retail. Like we think the 13 to 1400 square feet uh, gives us a lot of flexibility um, and, and more parking in the back. So I think that was the, the balancing act that we were, we were trying to pull off. And, and we ended up by push it, you know, keeping that, that lobby in the front. We also wanted to keep the residential piece not too far back because that's the, you know, the majority of the people are coming up and down uh, residentially. Um, and, uh, and so that was, and, and by doing so, obviously being able to provide as many parking spaces as we could, we thought was important. Um, on the leasing office, um, obviously, as we've started our um, uh, management company, we've We've done some things wrong and a few things right, and we're trying to learn and get, get better as we go. And I, um, we've talked with our, our team about this being a space that could lease from all of the buildings, um, uh, that could lease all the buildings. And it gives us a little bit of a walkway, gives us some presence. Um, it's not just tucked away in the middle of the lobby like uh, One East Pleasant is. Um, and we could right size it because you really don't need that much space. Um, you just need access. You need people to be able to see you and find you and come able come over and ask questions as needed. Um, uh, regarding the vehicular access, we do have a diagram showing turn radiuses uh, and it does work. Uh, it is working with the bollards, working with the height of, of the gash as it comes in. Uh, we've we worked on that a lot to, to make that work. Um, if you've got a you know four door long bed truck, you know it could be a little dicey, but um, for most vehicles, uh, it works just fine. Uh, the wood cladding; um, uh, these projects are framed in wood. Um, you know we're we're looking at mass timber uh, for future projects because, uh, especially a hybrid model where the walls are panelized and the and the uh, decks are CLT or NLT or one of the other LTs. Um, and in this case, we, we, we want to, uh, we think it's a very viable cladding product. Uh, the wood at Boltwood Place was uh, red cedar. Uh, we learned from that. Um, the wood at Kendrick Place is Alaskan yellow cedar. When we installed that, it had an oil-based Cabot bleach on it. Uh, that oil-based bleach leached the oils from the wood and led to some discoloration at Kendrick. When we did one East Pleasant, we used the same Alaskan yellow cedar because it's much better in our climate. And we use the water-based Cabot bleaching oil. And uh, that works. That doesn't leach the, it doesn't leach the, the oil from the Alaskan yellow cedar. It gives it a, a slight gray and allows it to gray gracefully. Uh, once we found that Cabot no longer sells the oil-based, they only sell the water-based, we went back and redid all of the wood at Kendrick Place um, uh, uh, to do that. We do not have the product yet for Boltwood Place, but we look forward to redoing that one here shortly. Um, the fire separation, yes, we looked at that so we don't end up with sprinkler heads sticking out of the side of the building. Um, I appreciate the architectural questions. Uh, the, uh, I can't even read my writing here. The, oh, the, uh, the question, oh, the target customer. So, we have a, and that's, that's one of the reasons we, sh we had this, this opening piece here is, is that's the conversation that Amherst needs to have is um, we have the majority of our housing is rental. The majority of that rental is directly affiliated with the university, whether they're 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years old, that rental housing is not going to, um, uh, that rental demand is not going to subside anytime soon. So uh, it has to go somewhere and we're in the process of determining where that goes. Um, so I think that um, uh, one, of the, one of the wonderful things about having built these buildings and operated these buildings is we've had to prove ourselves. We've had to show that, that, that management is the right thing, that, um, that we could manage it and that, um, and that um, the folks that are coming through our buildings are wonderful folks that you want to have downtown supporting local businesses. 
on a daily basis. Um, the parking is um, is always tricky. I think with this long site, we've uh, we've we've got that opportunity in the back, um, and um, it is a um, it is uh, it's we've got the width to do so. A double loaded corridor. We've got the ability to come in and come out. Um, and so I think from a parking standpoint, I don't know the number of permits that have been pulled from the town, um, but I think as we struggle with a housing crisis, we're gonna struggle with housing units or parking units. And that's a, that's a conversation that is being had in Berkeley, California, in Durham, North Carolina, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, in a lot of places where, um, where uh, the housing demands are so high that, that people are asking those, those, um, those questions. Uh, the solar studies, we can, obviously those are PDFs, so we can get you, you know, clean solar studies. Uh, the sewer, Actually, the town replaced the sewer from the roundabout up to just past One East Pleasant back in 2017. Um, so it does have the capacity. Um, the pipes that come out of these buildings are as big as the line in the street, which serves the entire downtown. So um, the codes extend um, well. Be you know, we have the ability to tie in out in the street uh, into new uh, infrastructure. And I think that was it. Thank you. Doug, you're good. Um, so at this time, it's eight o'clock. Usually we take a little five minute break and then we can get back to more board questions. And just for everyone's uh, information, uh, this looks like this will, you know, take more than, than uh, you know, one night. Uh, but we would like to, you know, wrap up tonight, you know, nine, nine thirty and not, not go to midnight as, um, uh, which no one would <laughs> would like. So just keep that in mind. But let's take a five minute break, and we can get to Andrew. Uh, he has his hand up next.
Okay. How are we doing, Pam? Pam, you're on mute. I never mute myself. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always ready to jump in there. Let's see. I think we are all back, although I don't see Maria. Can anybody else see Maria? Yes, she's there. There's Maria. Okay. Johanna, Janet. I think we're all back and good to go. I see Kyle and I see David. And I see um, Andrew's hand is raised and then Tom. Correct. All right. So okay. we're back uh, online. We are back. All right. We're good to go. Uh, Andrew, please. Thank you, Jack. Uh, thanks, Kyle. That really, it was a, a very comprehensive presentation and uh, I'm, I'm impressed by your recall of all the materials and, and that attention to detail. It, it, it really is, it, it is a beautiful design. Um, I had actually some of my questions overlapped with some that were already asked. Um, so maybe maybe a couple tweaks to my original thoughts would be, I had, I had similar concerns around the retail um, and how that might be reconfigured. Actually, I hadn't even thought about Doug's suggestion or it sounds like you've thought about it as well of moving the retail office. Um, I mean, could, the, could you just make the whole head be retail, right? And then shift over, and I'm, ooh, I lost my version of the plan here, but you know, could you move some of the building amenities like the gym to the second floor, like take up some apartment space, but then have uh, an area which is dedicated purely to retail. And, and you know, as you're saying, the 4,000 may be too big, but maybe you can get multiple 1,300 square foot uh, retailers in there if you think that that's more of an optimal size but I'm uh, wondering if that that's something that you might consider um, is is just playing with some of that configuration and and putting the lobby for the the package kind of back into the tail the tail half um, my list is my list is pretty short so I'll, I'll that's that's one thought um, I was it's like one of the first things I I thought when I saw this is like, wow, it's a lot of impervious surface, but then kind of reading through it's actually, it sounds like, like there's a reduction in, in impervious surface because of the materials you're using, the planting. So kudos to that. Um, I don't, I, I'm not an architect. I don't know enough about sort of the mechanics, the mechanicals that you have on the roof, but is there any opportunity to put any type of water reclamation on the roof, like, or, you know, rooftop garden or something to that effect to just green it up? Um, that was a thought that I had. Um, and then maybe tweaking a little bit on one of, uh, one of Doug's questions around the target customer and maybe, um, uh, is maybe I'll drill a little bit deeper. Um, have you determined what your rental rates would be? Like that might give us also a sense of, of who those target customers might, might be. Um, and yeah, I think that's the only kind of new stuff I would ask. So I'd, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on that, Kyle. Sure. Thank you. Uh, yeah, with the, the retail and where to put it and is it all in the head or is it partially in the tail? Um, driving into the parking is kind of the, the thing that sets all of that. And so you're left with this space on the south side, which works very well for the leasing office and the retail. I'm sorry, the leasing office and the fitness um, pushing the vertical circulation, the lobby and everything back into that was just never worked out for us. It ended up pushing the drive aisle way back. It ended up changing the, the you know, the circulation through the middle and um, created a retail space that had no back, um, which was not what we were looking for. We wanted that. Um, and then in order to bring a back to the retail, which every retail needs, we had to kind of brick up um, that walkthrough because that would then be the back of the retail. And so we, we again, we, we looked at it a bunch of different ways and, and settled on what we have because I think it, it gives us, you know, uh, the best location for all the stuff that has to run vertical next to the elevator from a mechanical standpoint and everything else. And then really allowed that ground floor to work out. And I, I understand the desire for potentially addition, you know, making that 1500 into 2,500 square feet. 
which I think would be about the max. Um, but I don't think that thousand square feet um, is, um, I think the benefits of the plan outweigh a slightly larger retail space. And that's kind of, you know, we started shift moving around that, that even that wall between the retail and the lobby uh, to try to get, a, to get a right fit. Um, for the stormwater, yep, it's, a, it's an existing site that has a lot of uh, um, pavement on it already. Um, and we obviously try to improve that. Um, we've, we've looked at, you know, green rooftops a, a bit, a whole bunch, um, but uh, um, it's tough to pull off unless you're really occupying that and making that part of your, um, your floor effectively for a space that's being occupied, like the design building at UMass, um, where you have this occupiable space that you go to and none of our roofs are, are, um, are occupiable. Um, and then the target customer um, and the rental rates. Again, we're um, uh, we we believe that the we, the people we have living in Kendrick Place and the people we have living in One East Pleasant are are absolute benefits to our downtown. Our absolute benefits to the businesses in downtown. Our absolute benefits to uh, the street life in downtown. And um, our um, are the are are the folks that will likely occupy this building. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, Tom? Sure, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jack. Thanks, Kyle. Um, Kyle, I really, um, as an architect, appreciate your project. Um, you know, the walkthrough on this site helped me really kind of understand what you're trying to accomplish. Um, I think Doug and Maria pretty much asked all of my kind of architectural questions that I might have about how certain things function. And I think, um, you know, as a zoning board, I'm also on the design review board. So I might have more questions and comments when I see you on that board in a week or so. Um, but um, one of the things that I think as a developer who's doing work in this area um, at the scale that you are um, and the impact that you're having as an organization individually on this community, um, I'm interested in, um, your awareness of the conversation in our current climate of developing inclusionary zoning and or affordable housing within our downtown, um, as well as in other areas, and the need for it and the demand for it. And so we speak about the demand for your clientele um, that you want to bring in, um, your impact on the community. It's also uh, important in terms of your ability to bring affordable housing to this community. Um, and that hasn't happened and it may or may not happen with this particular project. So I guess my, my, my question is really two parts and I think one's for Kyle and one's for Chris. Um, and Kyle, I'm just, I'm interested in what you see your responsibility to the community in terms of affordable housing, in terms of bringing a more diverse community to Amherst um, and what role you can play in doing that. And then Chris, what, um, I guess what options and procedures are, are in um, our um, toolkit to um, encourage um, affordable housing um, in a project like this, given that we have to give special permits um, and make negotiations around certain things that we have to give back. So I'm curious about procedure on that. So um, Kyle, I, I, I'm sure you've heard this conversation in town and I'm interested in your your perspective and um, how you see this project fitting into that matrix. So I'm gonna call on Chris because you broached a subject that was on my mind as well uh, with regard to the inclusionary uh, okay. zoning. So Chris. So the um, planning board and the CRC, the Community Resources Committee and planning staff have been working with the building commissioner on a number of um, zoning amendments. Um, some of which were uh, brought to us by town council and some of which um, the planning department and the building commissioner have put forward. Um, and, you know, certainly there are some zoning amendments that may have an impact on this project. And I'm sure Kyle is aware of those. Um, one of them is inclusionary zoning. So we have an inclusionary zoning bylaw that <clears throat> to date has been not very Mm, not very, uh, I shouldn't say not very successful. It has been successful in bringing some affordable units to town. And in the last couple of years, it's brought 20 affordable units. Um, 
prior to that, it was very weak. And uh, we've also made efforts with regard to um, working with developers to uh, develop uh, comprehensive permit projects where a certain percentage of the project is um, is provided as affordable units. Usually it's 20 to 25 percent in exchange for certain um, modifications of zoning requirements. Um, in any event, um, the town is now considering um, making its inclusionary zoning bylaw more uh, robust and um, there is a public hearing scheduled with the planning board and the CRC for May 19th. Um, and we're hoping that um, there's a successful outcome of that, that there are recommendations from the planning board and the CRC to town council to adopt the new bylaw. Um, at the same time, there are mechanisms that um, developers can use to um, not comply with, with that bylaw. There are mechanisms that are built into state law that I'm sure Kyle and Dave are aware of. Um, so um, how can I make this simple? Um, the first publication of the legal ad for the planning board's public hearing was Tuesday in the Gazette. So that's kind of a um, milestone um, that means something in terms of whether uh, zoning bylaws, new, new zoning bylaws affect a project or not. Um, but, you know, Kyle and Dave are working with um, their attorney, and I'm sure he is aware of different mechanisms that can be uh, brought to bear by developers to um, avoid complying with <laughs> zoning bylaws that are being considered. So, so in any event, that, that is in the works. So we're planning department, planning board, et cetera, are working on that and um, we'll see what comes to pass. The other thing that we're working on is mixed use building uh, zoning amendments. Um, so either of those may or may not um, affect this project. I can't say, uh, and I haven't had a conversation with the developers about this. And um, certainly if they want to talk to me about it, I'm happy to talk to them, but that's kind of the status of things right now. We're moving along with an inclusionary zoning bylaw. It's all on, there's a link to it on Engage Amherst. Um, there's a little box that you can click, or uh, maybe it's not a box, it's a link that you can click to get to the zoning amendments page on the planning department um, webpage that will tell anybody who wants to know what the planning board and the planning department and the CRC are working on with regard to zoning amendments, and that is one of them. So does that answer your question? Sort of? Sort of, yeah. I mean, I'm interested in hearing from Kyle on that and maybe having a discussion after. Yeah, I mean, I guess as one of my comments uh, at this point in time, yes, the town is at this point where we're reviewing so many zoning bylaws, they're all in play with this building, um, uh, moratorium that we're going to, you know, hear, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a couple of weeks. So there's all these things circling around uh, the town that concern planning board decisions. And, you know, I would, I would hope that you have um, some, you know, provisions to uh, knowing that these, these, you know, some of these changes may be, you know, you know, imminent. And so, uh, with that, Kyle, uh, do you want to respond to to Tom's? Um... Sure, yeah. sure. Um, obviously, this project we've been working on for years. Um, uh, we've been talking with Laird about it. Um, we've had there have been a number of leases that have been in place, um, and obviously, the existing buildings on site are not long-term, highest and best use for uh, the property. So when we get involved in a a project and we don't own the land and we have to procure the land, we have to go by what the bylaw states. And that's how we have designed this building uh, per the bylaw. Um, so there is a section of the inclusionary, there's a section of the bylaw that's inclusionary zoning. Uh, there are height limitations, there are setback limitations. Uh, that is all we have to go by as developers who are looking to obviously invest a great deal of money in town and pay a great deal of money in real estate taxes. 
to try to put together a project to the detail that we've been able to put together. So um, we have designed this project per the existing bylaw. Um, the existing um, inclusionary zoning portion has dimensional special permits that trigger inclusionary zoning. This project does not trigger any of those. Um, so uh, the, 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 the number of units that Chris referenced in terms of, of uh, adding 20 affordable units is obviously very important. I mean, the town of Amherst has spent a great deal of money to ensure that they are you know, above 10% um, for 40B purposes and to try to bring as much affordable housing as, as possible. Um, the affordable units is, you know, 10 per, the 40B process is 10%, right? And so we obviously have to focus a lot on that 10%, but we also have to focus on the 90%, which is the market. And that is the market that is consuming Amherst. That's the, that 90% is the reason you have a 10% problem. And the 90% is about producing housing. So any zoning amendment that makes it harder to produce housing uh, in any way, shape or form is going to work against the long-term goal of housing production. And I think that that's where Amherst finds itself right now is in a situation where um, each decision has to be viewed that way. Is it going to be, is this decision going to make it easier to make, to, to produce housing or more difficult to produce housing? And that's the basis for a lot of the stuff that's, that has changed um, at the state level, because that's when that gets applied at a municipality, municipality, municipality across an entire commonwealth, then the number of housing uh, units that you build over a 30 year period cuts gets cut in half. Um, so in terms of our responsibility, uh, Tom, I think, um, you know, Dave and I have always approached this from a responsibility to improve the downtown, right? I mean, when we bought Kendrick Park, it was paying $3,000 a year in real estate taxes, Kendrick Place. Uh, it was a vacant parcel. Uh, when we bought um, and worked with the folks who own the carriage shops uh, to redevelop that, that was paying seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000 a year. Uh, the fraternity up at Olympia Drive was also paying $15,000 a year. Those three projects now pay a million dollars a year annually to the town of Amherst. So I, we take that as a very serious responsibility. I think that that additional uh, tax, uh, tax dollars do a lot of things that we you know, trust the town to, to, to do the best they can with. But that's a million dollars that the town has now through our improvements in town that they did not have before we got started working. Um, so I think that it's a, I think that Amherst needs to stay focused on the 90% the market because that is the, by far the biggest elephant in the room. The 10% obviously is extremely important. We have to decrease our diversity I think if you see the tenants that are in our buildings, you can see it's a very diverse tenant base. Um, it is, you know, it well represents the people that come through our uh, wonderful town uh, on an annual basis. And I think it's, um, and I, I think if we, if we lose track of making sure that we, we, we produce housing in the next five to 10 years, um, that's gonna serve Amherst well. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, and uh, Janet, please. So I have a, just a few things to say, um, just to kind of um, keep the record straight, is that there is no residential zoning district in Amherst that doesn't allow multiple units on it. So um, we don't have single family zoning, and that's the only thing you can build on the lot. We have um, the supplemental dwelling units, and as we've learned through footnote M, a lot of our, uh, you can, and through, converted dwellings, there's, you know, you can build multiple units on most residential lots, um, probably not in the RO maybe. Um, and so I just wanna put that to the side. And then we do have a lot of institutional zoning um, and that is called UMass Amherst College and Hampshire College. And they're very capable of building housing for their students. And we would wildly encourage them to build more. So that land isn't locked up and kept away from more housing. So I, I just thought that presentation was a little, um, a little bit not quite what I think is the real, um, the facts on the ground. Um, Amherst has met its housing production plan goals that we had for um, five years and then we kept going and we kept on handing out more permits. The issue we have now is we met the housing production plan goals 
for a um, number of units, but we didn't meet it for middle and low income people and affordable. Well, actually probably, you know, blue collar and um, affordable low income housing meets. And that's the problem we keep on facing. And so I think the question that Tom is asking is, do you feel like you, you have a commitment to also provide some of those units as you're also making money and benefiting from um, our actually very liberal multi um, mixed use building um, things? You're also asking for a lot more space. That set, you're asking us to waive setback requirements. And I'm wondering, is, is there something you wanna give in exchange for that? But one thing I'm really wondering is how tall is this building? Because when you showed the map, um, which was called PR 20.01, the elevations map, it showed a 57 foot building, which would trigger our, afford, our current affordable housing requirement because you're asking for two feet. But then when I saw the development report, it seems like maybe you've lowered that to one foot, nine inches to, to kind of get away from that. So I didn't really understand how tall do you want this building to do? I know you get 55 feet. Do you want that extra two feet that would trigger the 10% requirement? Um, so I, I, you know, if you could just answer those specifically. Uh, sure. I think the first, the point on the, uh, the initial drawing, Janet and the single family is Dave and I um, are uh, of the opinion that the scale of the housing issue is, is much larger than the housing production plan um, uh, highlights. And I think that's, that's going to be more apparent in, in 18 months than it was 18 months ago. Um, I think you see that with the average home price. I think you see that with rents. I think you see that with people looking to continue to develop in and around Amherst. Um, so I think that the, uh, the issue is if we don't build the housing, uh, we're obviously not gonna get any affordable units, but that 90% of the market will continue to rise. So the $290,000 uh, uh, average home price in plans from 2013 is now closer to $400,000 average home price in 2020. So those things will continue to happen if, um, as, as this place continues to have a very high quality of life, continues to be two hours from Boston, uh, continues to be three hours from New York City, especially post COVID with people being able to Zoom and work from wherever they want. And I think if you talk to any of the realtors who are selling single family homes right now, um, uh, they, uh, there's obviously a demand issue and a supply issue, and I think that's going to get worse. Um, regarding the height of the, I can't, I can't, you're on mute, I can't hear you. Um, you're helping us build housing. It's not a question of like, we're not gonna build anything or we're gonna build all, everything. But you know, the, you know, I understand there's a bigger framework and that's actually something that the planning board and the town council and planning department were all grappling with and you're grappling with and you're also benefiting it from it, right? And so, Mike, you know, the question is- As is the town. We, yeah, and so has this, I mean, the other question I'm very, you know, like Tom is asking, would you be willing to do some affordable housing? Cause you're getting kind of extra, you know, you're asking for a setback, but I'm just wondering, is this building gonna be 57 feet high? Cause then you're just triggering our current requirements. And then we can just move on to talking about retail and other issues. I mean, or did you lower it or, you know, I have two different numbers in front of me. I, I have a stack of paper. So are you well, asking I think for if, feet or one foot, nine inches? Uh, uh, I believe that's, it should be clear in the documents that we've submitted. So I don't know if there's, if, the, um, if there's some different documents that went out. Um, I, we are not intending to go beyond the, the two feet that is allowed as discretionary within inclusionary zoning. So it's beyond two feet as is written in 15.1. Okay, so it's not one foot nine inches. So it's, it's okay. All right, and so, okay. So that was one of my questions or I was trying to get some clarification from, you know, I do have a lot of questions and, and one of them is um, about the retail space. So your um, buildings have um, increased our tax, taxes, you know, produced taxes and you've produced units um, and people are shopping from those, the tenants are, and yet there's fewer and fewer retail spaces because your buildings have replaced them. And so I think the idea of having a bigger rate, a retail thing in the storefront and maybe having a couple of small spaces would A, be places that your tenants can shop and could help keep small businesses in, in town that were lost. So I think that's a great idea. Um, 
so that's one thing. Um, in terms of parking, I think this is an issue that we're going to have to talk a, a lot about because this is a no parking district, but there's parts of this, um, both the special permit requirements and the requirements for site plan review that they're adequate facilities for the people, for the building, its use and the people who use it. And then that you're not creating a nuisance for um, you know, people, the, the buildings around you or the town. And we all know that um, the number of spaces provided by the buildings that you guys have built is hasn't people like many of your tenants have gone out and gotten um, permits from the town. 40 or 45 of them seem to be parking in that parking lot that will be where 15 East Pleasant is. And so my, you know, the question I think we should need to do is gather information is how many permits have people from Kendrick Place and what East Pleasant Street been asking for the town. I have some information here um, in addition, you know, and so, you know, how much parking are your tenants going to need? And I think we're kind of circling around the question of who are you renting to? So I, I think three of us have asked you, are you renting to undergraduates, graduates, um, university professors, families, you know, working people, plumbers? Do you, can you give us a sense in very specific terms like, is it mostly undergraduates? Is it 30%? Is it 20%? I'm sure they're all fine people, but we keep on asking this question over and over again. And I think we just want an answer. Who do you expect these tenants to be? Who are your tenants in the other buildings? You know, what percentage are undergrads versus grads? Uh, well, what we build market rate housing and we don't exclude anybody. And, and that's, that's, that's the, you know, the tenants in our building are the same mix as the 53% of the houses of the housing units in Amherst that are rentals. Obviously there are undergraduates. Obviously there are graduates. Obviously it's, it's a, the need that we satisfy in our units is the same need that's satisfied on the other 5,000 units that are rented in Amherst. So you, your, your tenants are and will primarily be students then? Is that what you just said? It will I, absolutely I like be students. In, but I just want to know the information. Well, and, and, and that's why I've shown the pictures of our social media, you know, that is very, that is available to anybody. I mean, our social media, our property management, that the need that Amherst has is being satisfied by all 53, all 5,000 rental units in this town. And that need is going to continue for as long as any of us are here in Amherst. Okay, so it's mostly, okay, it's, it's, I think that's all I wanted to know. Um, so um, I wanted to also talk about setbacks and public space. Did you want to talk about parking as well, Janet? Oh, yeah. Do you want me to talk? Um, uh, I mean, the, the municipal parking district that was, I think, first instituted in the 50s had a purpose. And that was to ensure that with these unique, awkward lots that the town was able to redevelop and was able to um, uh, bring housing downtown. And um, I think that the, that, con that, that continues to be the issue. As I said earlier, there are a number of municipalities around the country that are eliminating parking because they realize it adds cost to buildings, it increases rents, and it reduces the number of housing units that you can provide. And so that is a struggle that is across the country in a lot of high quality of life places where a lot of people wanna live and there's a large rental market. And I think that that is um, um, uh, something that Amherst, we, we obviously have to, to manage here in Amherst. Um, we've tried to provide as much parking as we can on site and still be able to afford the buildings that provide the housing and pay the taxes and provide the retail uh, that they do. Um, in terms of the size of the retail spaces, um, um, obviously when we uh, worked with the folks at the carriage shops to redevelop that property, there were a number of retail spaces. A number of them were um, uh, no longer viable. Um, we've got a number of retail spaces that are no longer viable through COVID. Um, the retail environment has completely shifted as everybody orders everything online right now. And we have, a, we have a fantastic strip as far as strips go that is three minutes from downtown Amherst with all a sea of parking as far as you can see in front of it. So the competition, you know, the retail future of Amherst uh, is definitely going to be different than it has been in the past. Uh, and I think that we have tried to right size the retail needs 
uh, um, in each of our buildings relative to what we see as, as the larger housing needs. Um, and I think that that is, again, uh, that's, that's what our downtown uh, needs to be. And, and the way that the retail uh, survives and thrives is by having people living there, by people walk in walking distance, by people who don't have to park in order to get a bagel or uh, to get a coffee or go out to eat. Good. I, I think uh, he hit. Janet, I keep on, I keep on I, muting, or I keep my. I think my computer keeps muting me. <laughs> uh, so okay. So so anyway. So that was. I mean, you know, I, I have a question for you, Jack, because I know that I'm sure there's a lot of people who want to make public comment, and you know, I'm an attorney, and so I, you know, I look at all the special permit requirements and all the site plan review language, and you know, in I'm, you know, deep into the heart of um, nonconformity. And so I wonder how we can organize this, you know, cause we could just all run through our list, but I do have more things. Like, do we wanna in the future say, let's talk about parking in retail. Let's talk about setbacks or public space. Um, do you know what, do we wanna organize that more? I just throw that out to you. Well, no, I, I, I feel like this is very, you know, an initial sort of presentation of initial feedback. Uh, to Archipelago with regard to their, their design. Hopefully, Kyle and David, you have found the comments thus far helpful. Uh, there definitely will be more because we haven't taken public comment. Um, we were waiting what the design review board. Uh, Chris, what else are uh, is out in the wings there? Um, the other group that you'd want to hear from is um, you'd want to hear from the uh, tree warden about the trees that are um, proposed right. to be taken down along the cemetery property line. And you'd also want to hear from the um, historical commission about um, any potential impacts that the project may have to the uh, cemetery. So the historical commission is going to be um, hearing about this project, I think sometime in mid-May and the design review board is going to be reviewing it, I believe on Monday, May 10th um, at five o'clock. And so um, hopefully by the next time you meet with uh, the developers, um, the applicants, you will uh, have heard from them. And um, my suggestion would be to uh, allow public comment tonight and um, continue the public hearing to June 2nd. And um, then, you know, Kyle and Dave can come back with answers to the things that they've heard. And um, you'll have more opportunity to talk among yourselves and the public will have more opportunity to um, make comments. So Jack, could I just, if I'm gonna, can I just take a two, two seconds more just to talk about um, setbacks and public space, just to okay. alert, sure. alert um, the applicants. So I think, you know, I, I was walking down around one East Pleasant, I walked all the way from, you know, one end of um, East Pleasant to, up to Antonio's. And in a lot of ways, one East Pleasant is an anom anomaly in the cent Amherst Center and on that road. Um, the sidewalk gets super tiny. I didn't actually realize that there was public space, like that kind of area that where the restaurant tables were and it's kind of dark and overhung. I, I never thought about that as public space. Um, this, our sidewalks are much wider and the buildings are set back and there's gardens and you know there's benches. And so it all gets really narrow at, at East Pleasant Street. So I would love to see this building open the sidewalk up again and, and have the building set back more. So there is more public space, there's more plantings and trees and we get that look of our downtown put together in a more um, inviting way. There's, you know, and I was walking along um, when East Pleasant and like, people were trying to pass me and couldn't, you know, and so it's so narrow. And so I think, you know, when I saw 15 East Pleasant, I was like, we need to make this much bigger. Um, and so I think I'd like to, maybe the planning department could do like a study of the setbacks of buildings and the sizes of sidewalks throughout the center. So we can, you know, have a coherent kind of street um, experience and kind of fix the problems we have with one East Pleasant. And we can't fix that one, but we don't have to continue it and make it hard to for people to walk. And I didn't really have any sense of public space and the overhanging thing. I don't think people would actually think it was public space. That's it. 
Uh, just you. just real quickly on that, um, that uh, there are the vast majority of buildings um, uh, around the, the common have zero lot line. Um, that is the bylaw how it's written that uh, that the the building itself sits on 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 the property line facing the public way. The only difference with one East Pleasant is how close the town put the curb on the street relative to that property line, so that there is no space to put uh, a sidewalk in front of it. There's not that same space that you have in front of Hastings or in front of. Um, uh, Judy's or in front of uh, High Horse, that, that space is not there. Um, because when they redid the south end of Kendrick Park and made the little parklet across the way, that got reconfigured and it became close to imposing on private property. So it's not, you know, the intent of the bylaw is to put buildings on the, on the property line. The, the issue that, that you're uh, complaining about at One East Pleasant is relative to how narrow the, the town's curb is to those property lines. So at one that's something the board might want to think about is at having the building kind of go back more and creating that, you know, because you're, you know, if you but there's much more space. Side, if you look at the property yeah. line, if you look at the site plans for 11 East Pleasant, um, there is much more space between the property line and the curb line at 11 yeah. East Pleasant than there is at one East Pleasant. It gets much wider there. So that space is available in the public way. So you know, anyway, that was just, Anyway, okay. <laughs> yeah, obviously, you know, the, the one East Pleasant Street was was uh, properly, you know, consistent with the bylaws there. And it's just, it was just a um, unfortunate circumstance where I think, you know, visually, if we would have, you know, taken everything together that, you know, perhaps the setback would have been suggested there, but it was compliant. You know, one East Pleasant Street is compliant, but I think everyone recognizes that it's a pinch point and probably, you know, hopefully the town will kind of will fix it, you know, down the road in terms of making a little bit wider there. But it's it's well, certainly not plan incumbent on uh, Archipelago because they, they, it was. But that's know, a, but Jack, that's a condition that the planning board could put, could impose is that we could we can we can require greater setbacks than so. right. But I'm just going. I'm just reviewing the one East Pleasant. You know yeah. how that was. You know it, it's it's compliant with the bylaws, but probably if if we had looked at it again, you know, might have asked, you know, for for a setback there. But hopefully but the town. Yeah, at we, some point can reconfigure and make the sidewalks a little bit wider there yeah, and, and, and come up with effects. So I'm just saying is that the planning, if I was in the planning board, I would have said, hey, under section 10.4, we can impose a larger setback. And so we do have that power here to kind of move the building around a little bit. Yeah. Not like a Ouija board, but we do have that power. So and and I think there is a setback, you know, there's 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 open space there on the first floor, which is which is nice and and definitely needed there so that's uh that's a positive maria oh chris chris has her hand up maybe she's speaking to something oh directly. i'm sorry chris i just wanted to remind everybody that we really need to raise our hands when we want to speak and not just have a dialogue back and forth um i think it um kind of gets out of hand so um you know jack is in charge of recognizing people and um, people really should respect that um of raising hands. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Maria. Um, thanks, uh, Kyle, for all your sort of responses. And, and I, I do agree that the way to solve this housing crisis as far as not having enough affordable housing is A, to create more housing. It's just not going to get there without that basic fact. Um, but I do uh, ask if you could just reconsider the retail because like you said, you know, it's a changing market. It's changed a lot already and <clears throat> we're doing a lot more online shopping, but you know, five, 10, 20 years from now, we don't know what's going to happen. So this is making it more flexible by um, providing something a little more, uh, have a little more ability to be like multi-function, multi-purpose because, you know, it's retail. It probably would never be a cafe or a restaurant. It's just not enough sort of back of house space but you know just thinking about the future and having that flexibility um, it just does seem a little tight just like a lot of members have said and um 
So in moving forward, if there's just um, maybe you could show us the options that you've already, you know, studied and this is the best way. And just to help us know, like, yeah, you've, you've covered a lot of other ways to look at it, but that this absolutely is the right one. And um, just because it, it does seem on the small side. So, but otherwise, um, yeah, look forward to the next iteration. Yeah, just going to kind of go off what uh, Maria said, my, in my, uh, very, um, you know, humble experience with regard to retail is that, uh, you know, people, um, small businesses have, have a problem affording uh, the rental rates downtown. And I'm just wondering if you increase that open air space in front and you have like, you know, like three seasons sort of, uh, you know, businesses out in front where, where it's affordable for, you know, some of the, the and capture some of the family business sort of vibe um, that, um, you know, some of the former buildings there that, again, they weren't really uh, thriving businesses, but um, I think that's might be what, you know, folks might be looking for to see when they go downtown, it just to see, you know, people in the streets and, and uh, you know, vendors and, 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 and uh, you know, kind of culture kind of coming at you as you're walking down the sidewalk. But that's just my two cents. Uh, any other comments? Uh, Doug? Thanks, Jack. You reminded me of something I, I had thought about and forgot to say earlier. And that, um, Kyle, the, when I think about the buildings that are down on the common, that are all zero lot line buildings, uh, there's a pretty strong horizontal, what I'll call a sign band between the first floor and the rest of the building that's up above it. And, and that combined with the way the first floors are, are detailed, you don't really think a lot about the building that's up above when you're walking along the street. Your, your attention is pretty fully focused on the street and, and the, the sort of architecture of the building doesn't really, uh, it's, it's not very present at the street. Um, you know, it's mostly glass, uh, but I think the buildings that you've done have pretty strong hor uh, vertical columns. And um, when they come down to the street, they're sort of, it's almost like they're too present. It's like, uh, and and I, I'm not articulating this well, but but um, and, and I'm not sure it's really even appropriate to the building you've got because you've got such setback at the first floor on this building. But um, I think it's part of the reason people have reacted negatively to some of the other buildings is that they're sort of too imposing at the street level. And, um, you know, maybe, I don't know, Maria, if, if any of this resonates with you, but I'm just trying to think about how to say it better, but that's just a comment. But, but in particular, the sign band, to go back to that, um, and, and, and having sort of a flexible place for, for your businesses, for your tenants in the buildings to, to advertise themselves, I think that would help the buildings feel more urban. And I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Doug. And uh, I don't see any other hands uh, amongst the board. So it's, uh, we're approaching nine o'clock. And I, you know, depending on the number of uh, attendees, um, the public comment, I'm not sure, um, I see some hands coming up. I, I, I would like to give, uh, I'm gonna wait here a minute. I'd like uh, the public uh, attendees to, uh, to raise their hand just so we have an idea of what we're looking like for, you know, timeline for tonight anyway. There's the comments, I got, I see seven. So that's, uh, you know, 20 minutes. And okay, 
that seems doable. All right, so I think we'll just start uh, taking uh, public comment with without any other public, uh, or excuse me, <laughs> planning board comment uh, members' uh, comments at this time. Okay. All right, so first let's uh, let's call on Pam Rooney. Uh, Pam, uh, state your name and address, please. Hi, Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. Thanks for letting me speak. Uh, appreciated hearing the background and the, and the sort of the coverage of the pro of the project. Uh, there are I've got about 30 points, which I don't have time to do in my three minute allotment. So I'm going to just focus on a couple of things that weren't really talked about in Mr. Wilson's presentation, and that's safety. And I'm focusing primarily on safety of Prey Street, which is a, a major pedestrian walkway and also a very narrow parking lot with perpendicular parking. And I'm going to ask if, if one of the conditions from the planning board can be that construction entrance be from East Pleasant Street only, thus avoiding the, the sort of the pedestrian and, and parking lot uh, portion of Prey Street. I think that's an extremely dangerous street already. Having construction vehicles is going to add to that. Secondly, safety during construction on East Pleasant Street. Um, I know we had to walk around uh, onto the street for one East Pleasant Street and I would like to at least see some description and documentation of how they plan to handle pedestrian safety on, on East Pleasant Street during construction. Again, all of this is uh, a major pedestrian uh, route from north of north of Triangle from the high school and down trickling down into the center of town. Um, let's see, safety. Uh, uh, one of the things that One East Pleasant Street was was required to do was to create um, a more appropriate pedestrian crossing to Kendrick Park, and according to the Jason Steele's report, that that improvement never got done by Archipelago, and that really should be done prior to any SPR or SPP in this in this round. Um, I'm going to reiterate one of the things that. That is that we're sorely lacking the public way. We have a very, very strong set of, um, we have a very strong sidewalk language that starts way back by Antonio's, continues on the uh, east side of uh, North Pleasant Street and then East Pleasant Street past Zana's to the toy box. One East Pleasant Street completely truncates that, that language and I would hope that the board will condition that 11 East Pleasant Street reinstate the, the street language that was developed by Dodson Associates some years back and that we see the same materials. We see actually go back and do an improvement of the one East Pleasant um, sidewalk, which is absolutely subpar and one of the worst examples of, of urban hardscape I've ever seen. And I hope that maybe this, this project can rectify that. Um, another public way issue is that I see absolutely no street tree plantings shown on the street side of the project. Um, why is that stretch not handled similarly to the Xana toy box stretch where you have 20 feet from face of curb to back of sidewalk any additional public space that the that the project wants to create beyond that would be very very welcome and in, in fact would really enhance their building, but at least reinstate the the proper um, public way. And I'm going to stop at that. I've got a lot more comments, but I think these are some sort of major considerations that would make this project a whole lot better if you sort of address the public presence of this building rather than the architectural details. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Uh, next, we have Dorothy Pam. Hi, Dorothy. State your name and, and uh, address. Thank you. 229 Amity Street. I just have a, a few questions at this time. Um, one of the things that is in terms of Kendrick Park that is missing is that we uh, there's no public bathroom there. 
and people used to use the loose goose, which is now gone. And there are no shops or places that I know of which have a bathroom which can be used by the public. And um, I think I heard you may say something about a bathroom on the first floor in a kind of public lobby area connect near the pedestrian walkway. So I was interested to know if in fact that was a bathroom that could be used um, as the Loose Goose's bathroom had been used in the past for people in Kendrick Park. Um, and the, the second question is, um, I don't totally understand the design. I know there's a pedestrian walkway. There's also an entrance to first floor parking. Is there any space where the pedestrians and the cars share the same path um, or are they totally separate paths? And the last one is, um, I do like the see-through path to the cemetery. I think that is very nice, um, but I was, wasn't sure why you would try to reduce setback from the cemetery, which is, you know, it's a very special place. The mural was just redone, rededicated, and um, oh, just don't don't crowd it in. So, I mean, there may be some reason that you have no choice, but I, I just wondered about that. So those are my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dorothy. Uh, next uh, would be Kathy Schoen. Mm. State your name and address, please. Hi, Kathy. Hi. Um... It's Kathy Shane. I live at Shane. I'm so I'm so sorry. I should know that. <laughs> I apologize. I apologize. Wait a minute. I just accidentally. Hi, Kathy. I accidentally um, disabled your speaking. Okay. No, I, I. You don't have to apologize. Um, one of my nephews changed the spelling of the last name so that it would get spelled. <laughs> <laughs> pronounced right. Um, I, I'm going to try not to repeat um, the comments, but just expand on a few on uh, how far back from the street uh, the building starts and Pam's point about it's not consistent coming through town. What is the public way? And my sense of what's happened over time historically in Amherst, because I asked Chris on the street, I live on Montague Road. I said, what does it look like if I went up Montague Road, my house, the house next to me? And she said, oh, you can get on the GIS map and it varies all the way up the street. So what a lot of other places have done is measured it from the edge of the street to make a consistent how far back. So the, uh, the set back is not from the existing sidewalk. So I think this is something we don't have on our books, but we could, as was pointed out, we could adjust it. Um, if the it's the current sidewalk that's there, it's gonna be narrow. And what happened when the carriage shops were there is you never noticed how narrow it was because you had big wide driveways into a shopping area. So the other question I, uh, so it's it's on setbacks. The second is on height. Um, 1.9 inches is less than two feet. And I'm sure that was chosen carefully. I'm not, I don't understand why we don't count the total height of the building. It's gonna have condensers on the roof. It's gonna solar arrays on the roof. And this has become a big issue in New York City, not uh, it is an urban area where the mechanicals, there was an argument the mechanicals just don't count in some way, but they do add to the height of the building. So I, I'm just looking for ways that the planning board can negotiate around some of this because the actual building will be higher. And I think it will be important to look at those shadows. I have one picture um, for one East Pleasant from the fall, and I want to get one from the spring. And this building is going to be directly across from Kendrick Park, where there will be a new playground. So I think it's important to think about what happens to the street side. And that will be very by how close to the street it is. Then my totally unrelated question is on Spring Street. There's another building being built that seems to have stopped construction altogether. And it, uh, the town council granted a temporary 15 months to obstruct the sidewalk and build out. And that ended in January. So I don't remember coming back, but the building was supposed to be finished. So I'm just wondering whether there was a financial difficulty and why start a new building before you finish the old one. That's an unrelated, but related to the financial capacity. And um, I think I will just 
stop on that. But for rents, uh, there was a question about what kind of rents you're looking at. If you look at what's posted on Spring Street, the building that hasn't opened yet, I think you get a good sense as a planning board um, what kind of rents. And it's in the $2,000 for studio range. So it's not dissimilar to what was at one is, is pleasant. And I have information if you want it and I can just send it in. There was a question on how many parking permits the buildings took out. And so as of 2019, 57 East Pleasant Street took out 59 permits and one East Pleasant took out 68 permits. So the people who are living in those buildings do have cars and they are seeking to buy a permit. Now we sell them really cheap in town. <laughs> so they're not, but, but they are buying a permit. So I assume they have a car. And I, I think I'll just stop there because I just wanted to expand on a few of the points, both the question, the height, the setback, um, and then is this really ready to go? Wouldn't we want to get the other building finished first? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Shane. All right. Um, hey, I would, I think, can we circle back to Spring Street? Because I think that uh, that requires, I, I think uh, it'd be good to have an update in terms of that development. Sure. Uh, Spring Street is on 26 Spring Street. It's behind, it's obviously uh, behind Grace Church and police station and so on. We shut 26 Spring Street down the day before the mayor of Boston shut down all construction in Boston uh, on Mar in March of 2020 for COVID. Um, we did that uh, because of its very sensitive location and we obviously sensed that something uh, very difficult was, was occurring, which obviously turned out to be the case. So we turned it off. Um, we did not turn it back on. We tried to turn it back on uh, with a new contractor this spring, which we intend to do. Uh, when we did so, Rockwool is six months out right now from um, any of their three North American manufacturing facilities in between like 150 and 180 days or something like that. So um, the building has been framed uh, up to the first floor. Uh, the framing remaining is uh, two and a half months. And with rock will be in six months out. If we started right now, we would be staring at a, a framed building for three and a half months while we waited for the rock wall um, to arrive. So uh, we shut Spring Street down for COVID. Um, we have tried to turn it back on and now caught in the supply chain issues, not, not mentioning the lumber prices, but just the ability to procure and get enough rock wool for uh, uh, the building, which is is the limiting factor. And Rockwell is the best insulation you can use. It's outboard the sheeting on that building like it's been on these others. And it's obviously very popular right now. How much uh, is, I, I know a lot of the, the construction materials have increased by, I don't know if it's 50, 100, 200%, but hopefully the Rockwell has not gone that Rockwell trajectory. Rockwell is more of just being able to get it with all the stuff including the ice storms in Texas and all this other stuff has really upset the lumber uh, the construction supply chain uh, lumber futures are if you look at any of the graphs are you know uh, multiples of what they normally are so um, yeah. we thought that that was going to be three months coming up you know four months ago we didn't know what was going on five months ago we didn't know if there were vaccines we didn't know if we were getting a new president we didn't know anything so uh, now that we know, it's just turned all back on, and and uh, and prices have gone up, and and availability has gone down. So, you know, we thought that those hiccups would be three months. It turns out those are more likely nine months, twelve months, and you're seeing that across the economy. I think when people try to get rental cars and you can't get them, is when uh, that'll be most apparent. Thank you very much, Kyle, for for the update on on. You know, you not the, not the subject of this hearing, but just it's just a good. It's valid for all of us. So, thank Jack, you. Yeah, Chris Brestrup has her hand raised. Oh, okay, Chris. So I just wanted to t uh, note something that um, if this project gets its permits, you know, in this summer, I'm not sure when it would get them, but in the next few months, that doesn't mean that the project is going to start under construction. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done by the applicants to get their building um, design finished. 
um, they're showing you, um, you know, a, a design that's in the formative stage, but they have to go back to their architects and mechanical people and plumbing and all of those people and get the building designed to the point where they can get a building permit. So it's not like, um, well, you might ask, well, if they can't work on Spring Street, how come they're pushing this ahead? Well, it just takes a very long time to move these projects forward. And so um, who knows what the you know, situation is gonna be like in six months or nine months, but um, you know, this is one of the steps they need to take to move this building along. So I just wanted to offer that explanation. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. All right, let's go back to the uh, uh, public comment. Dorothy, is your hand up? Um, probably not, because you just spoke. It just went down. Okay. Oh, so okay. Good. Good. All next, right. So we have uh, Ira Brick, please. Ira, um, you know, state your name and address, please. Hi, I'm Ira Brick, two five five Strong Street. I just want to make a few points. One is that I understand that the three projects being built by Archipelago are bringing in a million dollars of tax revenue, and of course that's important. But the town budget is eighty two million dollars, so we basically are making drastic changes downtown to get the revenues of 1.2% of the town budget. Um, if you look at how to get that million dollars from houses like mine, my tax bill times 143 houses would create that same million dollars, but there are 9,700 houses in Amherst. So it's a pretty similar statistic, 1.47%. I would just say, you would be my hero, Archipelago, if you were building these as dorms on campus and then raise the uh, pilot, the payment in lieu of taxes on campus and not make such drastic changes downtown. There are clearly many people in town, many who have signed the moratorium petition that just find, you know, whether you call them dorms or not, but you're saying in this phone call tonight that they are definitively meant for students. And um, I just also want to say I appreciate the comments of some of the planning board members supporting more retail. When I see the tiny storefront on the narrowest part of that building, it kind of reminds me when you say you buy lemonade and it says 5% real lemon juice. When you're talking about the definition of a mixed use building and how little public facing building public facing business, a building needs to be considered a mixed use building. It's really kind of a joke to give that tiny little space towards retail and then even create public space by denting that in. And I really feel like Archipelago who has made their living in Amherst is really not paying serious enough attention to the displeasure that a lot of people feel and that their downtown that they want to live and use in is basically being eradicated by what functionally are private dorms. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ira. Um, and Jennifer Taub. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, I'm thank Jennifer Taub um, at 259 Lincoln Avenue. Um, so I just, other people have spoken about the buildings and I just wanted to respond to some of the context that Mr. Wilson set up in terms of the need for more housing. I know I sound like a broken record, but just so it's kind of part of the record for the meeting. Um, so uh, Mr. Wilson had stated that there's huge growth in Massachusetts. And I think it's you know, fair to say that growth is in the Boston metropolitan area and not in Amherst. And actually the Donahue Institute at UMass, which is headed or while it was headed by our town council president said that growth in the Pioneer Valley in the 25 year period from 2010 to 2035 is a total of 6.5%. That's not a year, but that is the total for the 25 year period. And the population director at Donahue called this quote, okay growth, unquote. So we're not having a population surge in Amherst. And then in, um, Last year in 2020, in an interview with Boston.com, Marty Meehan, who's president of the entire UMass system, 
discussed the Democrat demographic cliff that's coming. And he said, quote, the number of college age students will drop almost 50%, 15% in five years, unquote. And he taught of the need for right sizing in the future because there will be much fewer students. And just today in the New York Times, they actually said 2020 had the lowest birth rate of any year since like 1970. So I don't think um, Amherst may be in need of a certain kind of housing, but I don't think it's in dire need of more of these dormitory style student complexes. And in terms of parking, um, Mr. Wilson mentioned, uh, compared Amherst to Durham, North Carolina and Berkeley and said, you know, they all struggle with parking. But Durham has a population of 270,000. So I'm sure it has a much more robust public transportation system than Amherst. Berkeley has a population of 121,000 and part of the San Francisco metropolitan area with its extensive BART and, you know, extensive public transportation system. And I would, um, you know, think it's probably fair to say that Durham and Berkeley probably have more essential services downtown to serve the population that lives there, like grocery stores, just for starters. So, and I'm also concerned because um, Archipelago, I don't believe any longer owns One East Pleasant and Kendrick Place. So I feel like when we fall off the demographic cliff, Archipelago will probably not be left holding the bag, but um, Amherst will. And I guess one other point of clarification is in um, a newsletter to his District 3 constituents this past weekend, George Marshall uh, wrote down what each of six buildings were contributing in tax dollars and six buildings, not three, contribute $1.2 million a year in tax revenue. And that's from George Ryan. Okay, so that's it, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Kyle, I, I, I think I'd like to hear from you on, on some of that because I know we were chatting during the, uh, the site visit with regard to the what the need is. And I, and I know like UMass provides 60% of housing for its student population. And I think the average state university across the country only provides 30%. So, you know, UMass is doing a lot, but UMass is growing, you know, and to UMass's credit and, and, and I would think, you know, that that's, that's good for Amherst too, right? And and uh, you had mentioned the graduate student population being uh, much higher than I had realized. So maybe you go over that one more time, and 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 it, you know from what you know some of the comments you've heard. Sure. Um, well, obviously, Dave and I don't believe there's a cliff. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't be taking all the risks that we're taking. Um, uh, I think some of the folks uh, have misrepresented what we've said on here so far. Um, I think that as we said that the, the tenants that will come through our buildings are the same tenants that go through the other 5,000 rental properties in Amherst. So 53% of all the housing stock in Amherst is rental. Uh, though that demographic is here, will remain here, will grow over time. And does that number become 60%? I, we, we don't know. And where does that, you know, where does that demographic live? And I think that's what we're, that's what we're discussing. So I think that there, uh, obviously UMass does house a lot of people on campus. Um, I think that the, uh, the ability for the university to build more housing is obviously limited um, as we've seen with the P3 that's taken a number of years. Um, to get where it's going to be, and we'll provide 600 beds, I think, total. Um, and I think that for as long as people say there's no issue, no issue, no issue, it just provides for cover for no action. And I think no action is the worst thing that we could take right now. Um, I think that um, as people have said, you know, have, have, uh, have, have said we don't have a housing issue, well, then, you know, the, the percentage, uh, the number of housing rental units has, um, uh, has not gone down. Um, so I think that um, obviously people can have different opinions on whether they think that the flagship campus in the, the state of the United States that's number one in education 
number one in innovation, number one in life science. If there are some people that think that entity is going to atrophy, then we can have a difference of opinion. We obviously don't think that's gonna be the case. Um, we think the university is, is doing an incredible job on all fronts. It's top 25 in the country now. It's got um, uh, excellent leadership. It's got the Institute for Advanced Life Sciences that has helped us through COVID here locally. Um, it's a uh, majority of people here in town are directly affiliated with it. And, and we're very fortunate that it's here. So uh, we look forward to the university uh, continuing to uh, thrive and get better as it has done. And I think that the sooner, um, uh, uh, the sooner we could stop um, imagining that the housing demand in Amherst is going down, the sooner we could start coming up with uh, solutions. So is, is it true that Archipelago is, uh, has divested of the Kendrick Place? Archipelago and... has never owned these projects. Archipelago okay. is the development entity. Each one of these projects is a special purpose entity as it remains today. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, do you have, do you have a, a handle like on, on the vacancy rate of your existing buildings? Do you, is it, is it something five, 10 percent or? Uh, well, obviously, COVID changed that for anybody who owns rental property in Amherst. Um, uh, but it is, it is, uh, vacancy is not an issue. <laughs> if you can ask anybody who owns a rental property in Amherst right now, um, vacancy is, is not a concern that, that we have. Yeah, I, 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 I sense that just from. from it's very low, well, Jack. Yeah, so I, I sense that from just the real estate market with you know the housing sale prices, whatever. It just it it's, it it shouts. Just that historically, every housing. every every study that has been done in Amherst has talked about vacancy, and that's always been it's always been extremely low. Yeah, thank you. Um, next we have uh, Kitty. State your name and uh, address, please. Hi, Kitty. Okay. Hi, <laughs> Janet. I love the way you um, greet people. It's very nice. My name is Kitty Axelson Berry, and I live at 89 Stony Hill Road um, in Echo Hill South, which is a planned urban residential development. Um, so first of all, I'm kind of cautiously happy to see several of you members of the planning board supporting what I see as um, more of a concern about um, public space, more safe, more of a concern about safety for pedestrians on sidewalks, all the things that I'm concerned about. So I just wanna acknowledge that and thank you. Um, less architecture that's so massive. So, okay, I might repeat myself or repeat other people and, I'm, and I don't know so much about planning, but it seems to me that the area along the cemetery um, the cemetery must be some kind of a historic treasure. I mean, it should be if it isn't. Um, and wouldn't it be possible to, instead of narrowing the street there and I guess keeping it like five feet wide, something like that, which seems to me to be a fire hazard, um, but couldn't the walk along the cemetery be promoted as something of interest, of value, of aesthetic, um, you know, uh, attraction. So I'm just I'm just wondering about whether it would be possible for the design to include um, making the cemetery walk a feature instead of a something that's like you can only see from the fourth floor where the community room is or something like that. Um, because also that little view corridor looks pretty narrow and it's helpful, but not enough in my opinion. Um, and also I'm wondering whether that little corridor, the view corridor to the cemetery is public space and how the public would be invited to walk down it if it is public space. I mean, I don't even know what public space means at this point um, because if the public doesn't feel welcome to it, how is it really public? That's a question. Um, okay, moving on. Um, housing crisis. I think that the housing crisis here is much more for family housing, for workforce housing, for low and moderate income housing, um, and not so much for students. Um, 
I wish there was more, there were more duplexes, more owner occupied rentals, more triplexes, I guess it's called, and more, you know, small, inexpensive, not so expensive condos for a variety of ages, or even more apartments that would be suitable for a variety of ages, including older people who, there was an article that economist Jerry Friedman wrote in the um, Amherst Indy last week about how students and old people like me um, are a good bet for a town because we don't cost so much because we don't have kids in the um, schools um, and we um, pay, pay property taxes or, or rent, which creates property taxes, of course. Um, so I, I really think it would be really nice if places like if Archipelago didn't only cater to students and because I looked up their websites and it says student housing for every one of these developments. It's like student housing. It's right there um, in the publicity or maybe it was for Harrison, the owner, or innovative living, the rental, whatever. Um, I think that we, whether it's the town or the planning board has the right to insist upon bigger setbacks on all sides, every side. And that I don't understand why the town wouldn't do that. I, won't, I, I don't understand. I mean, I hope the town would um, insist on bigger setbacks, not reducing the setbacks from 10 feet to five feet, from 20 feet to five feet. It's like, why not insist on like more setbacks, not less, where you can't even walk. Um, and finally, um, well, not finally, but the quit. So stop me if I'm over my time, please. Um, I, I didn't put my time around, but I, I'm sure you're over, but go ahead with your last point there. Okay. Um, I completely disagree with Kyle Wilson's sentiment that essentially people should go to the mall or order on the internet and not bother coming into Amherst unless they can walk. Um, and I know so many people, because I lived for over 40 years in North Leverett, I know so many people from Leverett, Pelham, Shutesbury, who used to come to Amherst. And when I talk to them, they say they're, you know, they just don't come here anymore, but they would, they would like to come here to do shopping, not just go to restaurants and coffee shops. Now they go to Greenfield or they go all the way out of their way to Northampton. Um, okay, that's it. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, hey, uh, the, from that comment, I think just Chris, I, I think the, the cemetery uh, should be clarified. There, there's nothing, there's no walkway or driveway back there. I just, maybe you can clean that up with the interaction of the cemetery. Uh, do you want me to answer that? Yes. So um, the cemetery is a public space and people are invited to come into the cemetery from two places. One is next to the toy box and the other one is on Triangle Street. So there's plenty of um, opportunity for people to walk around the cemetery. Um, the uh, space between the cemetery and this building is going to be a slope. And at the bottom of the slope, you know, it's going to be grassy and it's going to be. And it's currently a slope. It's not, it's not it's a right. It's not, a, That's it's right. not it's even a walkway currently. It's probably going to be wet and grassy. Yeah. And it doesn't seem like an inviting place to go. It seems much more inviting to be up on top in the cemetery um, where you can see everything that's to be seen instead of being kind of down in a hole that's wet, that's, you know, right next to a building. Yeah, so like, I don't think that um, it's realistic to promote uh, a public access along that strip when people could go and walk in the cemetery. Right. So that's, but, that's my comment. Yeah, but there is, uh, the point is like, there is no public access back there anyway, right now. Mm -hmm. and, and actually to view the mural on one East Pleasant Street, you can't see it if you're right next to the building, it's meant to be viewed from the cemetery. It's meant to be viewed from the cemetery. Yeah. That's so, right. okay. All right, so we have one more um, uh, and then and then obviously there's a lot more, uh, And but I think we have some other little small projects to clean up. So we'll continue the sharing, but uh, Janet uh, Keller, state your name and address, please. Hi, Janet. Janet, can you hi, mute? Hi, hi, everybody. There you go. Um, 
I, I would like um, Janet Keller, Pulpit Hill Road, 120 Pulpit Hill Road. And I would like to appreciate uh, the fullness and thoughtfulness um, of the planning board for so many aspects of this project that you discussed tonight. And then I would like to make an ask um, for the next meeting for the details of the stormwater plans for um, this development. If, if you could um, request that uh, those be discussed in um, detail um, enough to ensure us that a 100 year storm uh, would be uh, handled properly and, and not uh, cause uh, any danger to uh, outside of the site. And then um, I would like that triggered also an idea for me about that 20 feet of slope behind the building, between the building and the uh, cemetery. And should that be retained as part of the storm water, storm, storm water handling system. So um, thank you uh, for this opportunity. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Janet. Yeah, so I, I know you have a stormwater uh, report prepared that we can catch, you know, the next meeting. Um, at this point, uh, Chris, do we need to vote for the continuation or? Chris, you're muted. So, uh, one of the planning board members needs to make a motion to continue this public hearing for all three of the of the cases, the two site plan review cases and the special permit case. And I would recommend um, continuing it to June 2nd at 7.30. Okay. So, um, who wants to make it, Andrew? So moved as Chris has suggested. Okay, so we're talking about SPR 2021-07, SPP 2021-02, and then SPR 2021-09 continued to June, what? June what 2nd, June, June, June 2nd, no. okay. June 2nd at 7.30. Okay. And there's a second somewhere. Second. Okay, Janet, and any discussion? Uh, do a roll call here. Uh, Maria? Yes, approve. Andrew? Aye. Doug? Aye. Tom? Aye. Janet? Aye. Johanna? Aye. And myself as, a, as an aye. So that's uh, unanimous. And we'll see you. Thank you, Kyle. And Thank you. David, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in wow. a second. Bye. Thank you very much. Take Bye. care. Appreciate it. Bye -bye. Thank you. And so next, you know, this is, uh, we're, we're kind of like 930. Uh, we would like to wrap up. Fortunately, we did the Kendrick Park Playground Old Business. Uh, topics not reasonably anticipated, 48 hours part of the meeting. Is there anything? Oh, great. All right. And new business. No new business. Topics not anticipated. Okay, great. Form, uh, form A uh, subdivision applications. We have, we have one and Pam can show the uh, plan. Um, I think she's got two plans. Oh, look at that. That's wonderful. Oh, wait a um, minute. Oh, you've Hold got the, I'm you've got more the wrong thing. Hold on. Um, so yeah. I'll just start off and tell you that it's um, an A and R that you've seen before. Uh, it's property at the corner of Harkness Road and Belchertown Road. Um, about a year ago, you looked at this property previously, and um, it. Um, the uh, configuration of the property as a result of the previous um, ANR was two lots at the corner, which Pam can show you. They have that one and that one. Yep. So those aren't changing at all. And then there was one large lot 
which I think was called lot one, and it was a big, uh, big lot with that red line. Yep. So that was one lot. And then there was this little corner lot here. Um, so now the landowner, um, and just to let you know, the uh, areas closer to the, um, closer to Harkness Road, those two lots that are closer to the corner are in the RN zoning district. Um, the other three lots are a lot of them, uh, a lot of their lot areas in the R. LD district. And so the RLD lots are required to have at least um, two acres or 80,000 square feet of, of lot area um, and a building circle of 200 feet. Now the house, there's an existing house that's close to Belcher Town Road. That is um, Pam, if, if Pam moves her cursor over to- I'm sorry, which lot did you say? That, 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 lot, that lot that you're pointing to right now, there's an existing okay. house there. And that house, most of that house is in the RN zone. So it's allowed to have a building circle of 120 feet, whereas the lots where the buildings will go in the RLD are required to have a building circle of 200 feet, which they do. So these lots are um, configured, the new version of these lots are configured properly. Each one has over 80,000 square feet. Each one has, um, more than 200 feet of frontage and each one has a building circle of 200 feet, except for that one that has the house in it already. Okay. Um, so we're asking you to, oh, and I should say, the new lot lines are the, um, let's see the north, uh, oh. I'll have to orient myself here. Um, north is to the right. So um, on the Western side of lot five, there's a new lot line that's being drawn. Um, maybe Pam can show that. Yes, that's the new lot line. And um, if she can drag her cursor over, yeah, that's the new lot line too. So those are the new lot lines. Essentially what they're doing is they're creating a new lot five. They're making lot four a little smaller and they're making lot one smaller from the previous iteration that you saw mm -hmm. a few months ago. Mm -hmm. um, so what you are being asked to do is to authorize the chair of the planning board to sign this plan, um, making a statement that um, this plan, this configuration of lots does not require uh, going through the subdivision process. In other words, there's no road here. Um, you're not creating a new road with lots off the, the road. You're creating lots that are on an existing road. So the statement is that this is um, approval not required. Subdivision approval is not required. So if you would authorize Jack to sign that plan, that would be, um, that would be helpful. Chris, Thank you. Chris, could I ask a question? Yep. Or Jack, so I'm a yep. little, so I, I was beginning to wonder like, why isn't this a subdivision, but that explains it. Um, did you say that in the, RO, it has to be two, two acres? Yes. And so I can barely read this, but it looks like lot five and four are not two. Well, it has to be two, it has to be 80,000 square feet, which is almost two acres. An acre is 43,560. So if you multiply that by two, you get 86 something. But the zoning bylaw actually requires 80,000 square feet per lot in the R. LD zoning district. So these lots do meet that 80,000 square feet requirement. Okay. Sorry, okay. I wasn't clear about that. Yeah, I can hardly see that, but I, okay, that makes sense to me. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Doug, you have a question? No, I'd like to move that we uh, allow the chair to declare that this is not required subdivision approval. Very good. Uh, is there a second? Second. Uh, Thank you, Janet. Any discussion? I see no hands raised. I'll do roll call. Um, Maria? Approve. I don't think we have to vote on it. Do you don't do really need to vote. You can just sort of do it by consensus unless someone objects. <laughs> <laughs> Might be quicker to do. No, all right. Be quicker Any to objections? Do we started, so we should finish. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, I see no objections. Uh, let's let's roll. Um, upcoming ZBA applications. 
Oh, I'm very sorry. No, I have nothing new to report tonight. And upcoming SPP, SPR, SUB applications. I think I told you about this one before, but the Emily Dickinson Museum is putting in a, a generator and some other mechanical equipment. And so they're doing some work behind the existing garage and I'll be bringing that to you on um, June 2nd. Very good. Uh, plenty board uh, committee and liaison reports. Um, I think I'm just gonna, with regard to the planning, uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, I did forward you, Chris, um, there's a housing um, symposium tomorrow, uh, midday. If you could distribute that email, looks interesting. Oh, um, yep. You remember that, okay. Yep. Um, and I don't, I'll let other people go. Maybe I'll remember uh, uh, what was discussed in the last uh, meeting. So it was, it was an executive uh, meeting. So it was just more um, logistical. But uh, so the CPA committee, Andrew. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, uh, we met last week. Um, and we finalized the language for the, um, the Amherst Community Preservation Plan. So this basically has uh, information, kind of an intro to what CPA is, as well as providing some detailed information on how you can apply. Uh, that's hopefully going to be loaded this week, but you know maybe next week. Um, and that essentially wraps up, I think we may still have like one other not technically meeting, but some opportunity to get together, but we're essentially wrapped for, uh, for, for this year. Very good, thank you, Andrew. Thanks. Um, Doug, uh, Ag Commission? Nothing to report, we have not met. Okay, and Design Review Board, Tom, you spoke a little bit earlier. Yeah, we, we had um, a conversation, obviously, about the sign uh, in Kendrick Park. Um, we also had a conversation to approve um, signage for um, Aspen Heights, which is uh, in the storefront um, near Bueno, across from Town Hall. Um, it's the, uh, a new storefront there as their kind of retails or their uh, apartment sales um, uh, location and that's 40 uh, 40 Main Street so it's right downtown um, and they just have some vinyl graphics in the in the storefront that haven't that needed to be approved so um, those were approved um, and then we have a meeting um, on Monday May 10th um, 5 to 7 um, with the archipelago archipelago group um, regarding the materials we just reviewed here great thank you um, and then the CRC, uh, Chris, I remember there's some. So the CRC reviewed um, a number of things with our planning staff and Rob Mora. Um, we went over um, the mixed use building uh, definition and standards. And I think we're gonna be bringing that to the planning board on Wednesday, this coming Wednesday. Um, we also talked about um, apartments and Maureen Pollock is working on a definition and some standards for apartments. Uh, so we'll be bringing that to you as well. Um, we talked to them about um, the BL zoning district and that still needs a lot of work. So Nate is continuing to work on that. And um, I think ADUs, accessory dwelling units is moving on to um, be presented to the town council for a um, referral to, back to the planning board and the CRC. So that's moving ahead. We didn't really talk to CRC about that. Um, so next week, uh, this coming week, the CRC is gonna be meeting about the housing policy that's being proposed. They're also going to be looking at um, the work that Maureen has done on apartments and they're gonna be looking at um, the demo delay bylaw, which is pretty far, uh, pretty far on its way to being done. Um, and then we'll be bringing zoning amendments to you all on Wednesday. So we're working pretty hard on those and hoping to move them ahead. And as I said before, um, the inclusionary zoning bylaw and the moratorium are going to, I didn't mention the moratorium, but 
uh, both inclusionary zoning and the moratorium are going to have public hearings on May 19th, um, the planning board and the CRC. So you'll get an opportunity to talk about that at that time. Very good. Uh, report of the chair. I think I, I, I don't really have anything. Um, and report of staff. I don't have anything either. Not at this time. Okay. So we are meeting next. Um, next Wednesday at 630 to talk about zoning. Okay. And I All think right. everybody said they could come. Okay. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's, we kind of fit that in um, recently anyway. So, hey, uh, happy Cinco de Mayo to everyone. Cinco de Mayo. We, we, we survived another festive planning <laughs> board day, so. <laughs> we are adjourned. It's 9.45, just want you to know. All righty, all you. right. Take, Thank you. Take Thank you. Care. All right, Bye. see you. Bye. <laughs> Go get that margarita, Jack.